In 2019, U.S. media accused China of bullying in the South China Sea due to its giant terraforming operations to create artificial islands. One of the major consequences of these islands being built up, according to the press, is the possibility of an all-out war with the USA. That's not how China explains things, nor does it admit things could presently be going wrong with these islands. As you'll see in the video today, China might have a major problem on its hands which could turn into a supremely expensive catastrophic failure. Before we get to those failures, we should explain exactly what these terraforming operations are and what they might mean for countries in the region and for all of the US. We'll finish the video with our thoughts on how useful those islands would be in a war with the US. Let's start off with Fiery Cross Reef, said to be China's biggest land reclamation project in the South China Sea. China claims the island, part of the Spratly Islands, for itself, but so does Taiwan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Before 2014, there really wasn't much going on at Fiery Cross Reef, but now it looks like a place that would be useful in a war. As you can see on any map, the area is surrounded by many nations. China claims much of the region as its own, which includes the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands, and also other places such as Pratis Island, the Verrecker Banks, the Macclesfield Bank, and the Scarborough Shoal. China places a nine-dash line around the areas it thinks it controls. But where did China get the idea that everything within this nine-dash line was part of its territory? Who gets to make such decisions when so many countries are nearby? The most powerful country might be China's answer, but its rivals would certainly disagree. China was the world's superpower for centuries. If you look at the history of global GDPs, China and India were both much richer than the other powers in the year 1000. It's believed together their GDPs made up about 50% of the world's total GDP. In the year 1600, that share was 51.4% of global GDP, with China being about 29% and India around 22. From around 1700 to the late 1800s, China was easily number one. Depending on which historian you ask, sometimes these values are slightly different, but no one disagrees that China and India led the world in terms of money. China called Europe a backwater for centuries, when much of Europe really was a backwater compared to the highly advanced civilization of China. This is one reason why China can confidently talk about its ancient maps and records that show various dynasties, including the Song, Yuan, and Ming dynasties, which were in control of the South China Sea. An official Chinese statement to the EU in 2016 said, According to Chinese ancient texts as far back as the Han dynasties, China had large-scale activities of ocean navigation, trade, and fishing, with the South China Sea being the major ground of China's maritime activity at the time. It goes on to say that China discovered these islands, the islets, the reefs, and the shoals, and other countries, and the EU might disagree, nonetheless it explains China's claims. Before China's so-called 100 years of humiliation said to have begun in 1839, China's economy was six times bigger than that of the superpower Great Britain and 20 times bigger than the fledgling USA's. But all this changed, and it changed relatively quickly. During this period, much of China's territories were lost. Due to many factors including China's isolationism, as well as a failure to properly modernize its military and corruption within the Qing dynasty, China experienced a century of military losses. With them, it lost much of its territory. The British kicked this all off with the first opium war between 1839 and 1842. That's when China lost Hong Kong. In the second opium war, 1856 to 1860, the French joined the Brits in beating up China. This was not a good time for China, as it signed what it now calls a series of unequal treaties. The French and the English even looted China's summer palace during this phase in China's history, which even the West now admits was very much out of order. This period was certainly a humiliation for the advanced nation of China, which some scholars say is a reason for its sometimes aggressive attitude. The words never again are now a part of China's political rhetoric. In the Sino-French War of 1884 to 1885, China ceded influence in North Vietnam to the French. Later, after the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895, China lost control in Taiwan when Taiwan fell under Japanese colonial rule. The Qing Dynasty of China had previously annexed Taiwan in 1683. As you know, Japan was defeated in World War II, and then after that, China reclaimed territories, including the areas we're talking about today. In 1949, the Chinese nationalists were defeated by Mao Zedong's communists. The nationalists escaped to Taiwan, but importantly, they still claimed the South China Sea. Prior to leaving it, it was this regime who drawn the territory map, an 11 dash line around the South China Sea. That's why Taiwan still claims to own this territory, but the PRC doesn't see it this way. The reason the line was reduced to nine dashes was because of a treaty between Communist China and Vietnam. 
The history is a lot more complicated than this, but let's just say this entire area is heavily disputed by a handful of countries. Given its history, China doesn't think there's anything to dispute. Nonetheless, China and Taiwan claim the region for themselves, while other countries only claim parts of the region. For example, in 2009, China said China had indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters. Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Brunei disagreed and Taiwan definitely disagreed. It's Vietnam and the Philippines who seem really against China's claims. Over the years, Vietnam has created 49 outposts across 27 different features in the Spratly Islands. The Philippines has built 9 outposts, but none of these nations have done the kind of building China has. As you'll see at the end, the Philippines has just taken a big step toward ensuring China doesn't try to take any more reefs or islets or islands in the region. Such disagreements might make more sense when you understand that about 3.37 trillion US dollars worth of global trade passes through the South China Sea every year. That's about a third of the total trade in the entire world. Almost 40% of China's trade passes through the South China Sea, as does about 80% of its energy imports. Close to 14% of all US maritime trade passes through the area. If this trade corridor was ever blocked, it would cause mayhem in the US, as it would elsewhere. It said around 30% of all global crude travels through the South China Sea. So do about half of the world's fishing vessels. Then you have the rights to fishing there and all the natural resources, including crude oil and natural gas. About $11 billion worth of oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So, if a great big war were to break out, having control of this region would be a strategic feather in your cap. That's one reason why it really matters who the USA takes sides with in the disputes over these territories. Obviously, not China, despite China certainly having a strong claim. Still, other countries also have a strong claim. It should also be said that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has invalidated China's Nine-Dash Line claim. Also in 2016, an international tribunal said China had violated international law by building those artificial islands. Ok, so back to Fiery Cross Reef. We hope after hearing what we just told you, you understand why this 677-acre bit of land is so darned important. The Philippines, Vietnam, and Taiwan might claim the place, but it's China doing the construction there, and there's not much the other countries can do to stop it. The process of reclamation involves dredging sand, soil, and rocks with large dredging vessels from close to the reef. The materials are taken to the site, where they're laid down to create a surface. This space is compacted, and more heavy machinery reshapes and levels the place until the topography is just right. Once the land was raised at Fiery Cross, Chinese workers laid down the concrete and constructed the infrastructure and buildings. This includes an airstrip, aircraft hangars, communication facilities, radar installations, accommodation, port facilities, and various administrative buildings. The island is protected with coastal defense structures. In such a wild place, coastal erosion is more than possible. Creating bits of land in the sea and hoping it'll stay solid is quite ambitious, and maybe even a little foolhardy, not to mention expensive. No one knows exactly what China spent just on Fiery Cross, but it's estimated that it was around $12 billion. And that was years ago, as you'll see later, the upkeep might prove to be a very big expense. In 2014, China stationed about 200 soldiers on Fiery Cross. In 2016, after the 3,125 meter long airstrip had been built, it started landing civilian and military aircraft there, including a military transport aircraft. It was subsequently reported that anti-aircraft weapons appeared on the island as well as a missile defense system. There were also early warning radar sites on the island. This was reported after China had said it had no intention of militarizing the place. It didn't look that way to outsiders. The US State Department soon issued a statement saying there was a pressing need for claimants to publicly commit to the reciprocal halt to further land reclamation, construction of new facilities, and militarization of disputed features. China's artificial islands soon became known as the Great Wall of Sand. While much of the rest of the world is talking about these islands being something close to stationary aircraft carriers or fortresses in the sea, China keeps playing down the fact that they're military installations, while they certainly look like military bases. China has a good reason to want to keep this area secure. It makes sense in a world dominated by power politics, especially in this era where people talk about the balance of power shifting from US hegemony, unipolarity, to a global power balance, bipolarity or multipolarity. China might not want to get into a war with the US and its many allies, but it certainly will want to defend one of the most important strategic areas in the entire world. Still, China won't admit that, 
It has just said it's improving the working and living conditions of people stationed on these islands, or that the islands are for fishing assistance, weather reports, offering shelter, or helping out distressed ships that pass by. Nonetheless, the Western media has pointed out many times that missile defense systems aren't generally required for protecting fishermen. Not all the islands look exactly like military bases, but many do, such as the Gavin Reefs, also claimed by Vietnam, Taiwan, and the Philippines. At just 210 acres, we're talking about a tiny place, about the size of 119 British soccer pitches, if we take those professional pitches as being 1.76 acres. It's now home to anti-aircraft guns and a missile defense system, so again, not exactly fisherman friendly. The aptly named Mischief Reef at 1,380 acres is a much bigger project east of the Spratly Islands. Yet again, when China first started bringing in heavy machinery, some countries asked what China was doing there. It lies just 135 miles off the coast of the Philippines, Palawan Island. When the Philippines asked what China was doing, China said it was a fisherman's shelter. It now looks very much like a military base. The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies released satellite images showing large anti-aircraft guns and probable close-in weapon systems. That said, China is arguably only doing what other nations would do in this world of balance of power politics. China has also built a 2644-meter runway there. The country at least admitted this when it later said the weapons were placed there for freedom of navigation. The Philippines has said this is about one thing and one thing only – conflict or possible conflict. An international tribunal later ruled that it and other nearby reefs were low-tide elevations that do not generate entitlement to a territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, or continental shelf, and are not features that are capable of appropriation by occupation or otherwise. In short, these reefs are not for building military bases, and since they're not classed as a nation's actual territory, the U.S. doesn't have to legally make a so-called innocent passage past the islands because in terms of international law, there are no islands to speak of. China made something out of nothing. You can see China's progress through a series of satellite images taken over the years, which amounted to turning almost nothing into something. It's a similar story with Subi Reef. Once a piece of wild reef, now a developed bit of land with a military base, a harbor, and a landing strip about 3,000 meters long. Some of these islands are home to laser and jamming equipment. Fighter jets could land there. There's absolutely nothing about the island that screams fisherman's shelter. In the past, when the U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft have flown through the area, they've been warned that they've strayed into China's airspace. One of those radio messages said China has sovereignty over the Spratly Islands, as well as surrounding maritime areas. Stay away immediately to avoid misjudgment. The pilot shot back, well not literally, I am a sovereign immune United States naval aircraft conducting lawful military activities beyond the national airspace of any coastal state. Exercising these rights is guaranteed by international law, and I am operating with due regard to the rights and duties of all states. It's on these missions that U.S. aircraft have seen that these islands are a bit more than places where fishermen can put their feet up for a few hours. Images show harbors that can take at least 40 military vessels. They expose runways big enough for bombers and enough weapons to turn disputes into something ugly. A U.S. Navy spokesperson said they threaten all nations who operate in the vicinity and all the international sea and airspace. That's the reason for sojourns through the area, what the U.S. calls freedom of operation missions. These operations, phonops, are what the U.S. call operational challenges against excessive maritime claims, whereby the U.S. demonstrates its resistance to excessive maritime claims. China is no fan of phonops, once calling a particular operation a serious infringement on China's sovereignty. It's not only the U.S. that conducts them. In recent years, Japan, the U.K., Australia, and France have all launched phone ops, to which China usually invokes words such as escalation and provocation. But critics of this Chinese mission in the South China Sea have said the escalation started when China started building the islands. In all, there are seven reclaimed pieces of land with a total area of 5.2 square miles. It might not sound like much when you put it that way, but you can get a lot of weapons and runways in that amount of space. Also, to put these great chunks of concrete in the sea, China's had to upset the local ecology. At Mischief Reef alone, which is about six miles long, China had to bury the original natural reef under millions of tons of sand and gravel. For all the islands, we're talking about many, many millions of tons of sand and coral that had to be dredged and dumped. 
When China started building these islands, people not overly concerned about military strategies and war warned that there was a good chance that these fake islands could wash back into the sea, which in short would make life for marine animals and plants very hard. You have oil and chemicals and all sorts of dirt that could form clouds of matter that the sea doesn't need. One professor argued that all we've really heard about is military threats and the environmental threat has largely been ignored. He told the media, the worst thing anyone can do to a coral reef is to bury it under tons of sand and gravel. There are global security concerns associated with the damage, it's likely broad enough to reduce fish stocks in the world's most fish-dependent region. On top of this, Taiwan is saying China is stealing its sand, so Taiwan had to ramp up its Coast Guard efforts. Some say China's done this as a warning, and also to ensure not as much money is spent on Taiwan's military. In 2020, the Taiwanese military cracked down on 4,000 Chinese sand dredgers and sand transporting vessels, which was a 560% increase from 2019. The country says these operations are wrecking not only local ecology, but also undersea internet cables. So, we have islands by the sea that by international law should not be there. They've been built on unstable ground, and as you know, this ground could erode and wash back into the sea. There might be no way of stopping this. China might be a technological powerhouse, but nature always has a way of saying, keep out. Reports have stated that on some of these islands, concrete is crumbling, which means the very foundations of these islands could wither away and what stands on them could collapse. This is reportedly happening not because of any freak weather, just because the islands are in such an unforgiving area. Matters could be made much worse if a typhoon hits. There's also tectonic activity that could easily shift their foundations, while natural erosion could also cause the subsidence of these islands. There's also a natural process called sediment consolidation. This means the material that was laid down can become more compact, and when that happens, the entire island could move downwards, aka sink. These islands are so low that global warming also presents a threat. If the sea level rises, it might swallow the islands. It's said the global average sea level has been rising at an average rate of about 0.07 to 0.14 inches per year over the last century, but global warming might accelerate this. It's not certain what will happen, but low-lying islands are certainly within earshot of danger. In fact, it is possible that within decades, some of China's artificial islands could be totally swallowed up by the sea. That's if war hasn't finished them off long before that. The islands might well be sinking, and if they are, they could end up being huge wastes of money. Being so far away from the Chinese mainland, they aren't exactly easy to maintain in terms of structural problems. But even if they're not sinking, you have to ask what use they would be in a war. If it ever came to that, the US would likely strike at the three main islands with ballistic missiles, using electromagnetic warfare technology to get past the island's air defense systems. The US might also just form a blockade and starve the islands of food, weapons, or other materials. This would be quite a task given China's navy now is big or bigger than the US navy, although it doesn't have the same combat experience or missile strength. The main islands can hold a few fighter planes, likely 24 for each island, or even a bomber or two, but in the large scheme of things, a stationary target is a lot easier to hit. That's why one military analyst asked, are they a military asset or a liability for Beijing? There's no doubt that if war did happen, the US Navy can neutralize these islands with cruise missiles. One analyst believes it would take 30 to 50 cruise missiles for every one of the biggest outposts. As the aerial photographs show, the critical infrastructure on these islands is lumped together. It would not be hard to hit something important, while penetrating munitions would cause damage to structures that seems are already eroding. The US Air Force could send in strategic bombers armed with cruise missiles sent from a number of bases. China might have enough aircraft shelters for its fighter aircraft, but with one runway, it would soon start to look congested down there, and any strike would quickly make that runway unusable. With US submarines, you also have supply issues for China. China does have enhanced anti-submarine warfare capabilities, meaning US submarines still pose a problem. This could be one reason why China has invested so much in submarines as of late. China's islands have rightly been called a challenge to enemies of the regime, but in the event of war, it's hard to see China being able to keep them. They certainly are a substantial presence in the region, but more so to smaller nations. The US could deal with them, we think. The US has seen its fair share of military failures over the years. The US would suffer greatly in the effort of trying to destroy them, there's no doubt about that. That is, if China can save them from sinking or falling apart before that happens, which we imagine will become a very costly venture for China. It seems the country is willing to spend the money, having reportedly just built the world's largest suction dredger that is 50% more powerful than the so-called super dredger used previously. The old one was 6,017 gross tons and had a dredging capacity of 4,500 meters cubed per hour, 
that was said to be the largest in Asia, so the new one is something special. What does this mean? Well, for one thing, it seems China is certainly getting ready to do some more dredging. That's why the government in Manila believes that China might move on to other islands in the region. It's the reason, or one of the reasons, why after 30 years, the Philippines is opening up its doors again to a U.S. military presence. U.S. troops will have access to four new military bases there. As China digs, the U.S. is setting up shop, just like it did during the Cold War. How this ends is anyone's guess. Now Imagine you need the scene. scene. It's July 2023. In a meeting, Vietnam's Minister for Culture, Sports and Tourism is furious, his face twisted into a picture of superlative disgust. Behind him on a large screen is an image of a pretty blonde American lady decked out in a smart button-up dress. I want this movie banned, he snarls. I want every single image, digital, paper or even printed on a little girl's knapsack removed from this country and dumped into the trash can of fake history. He's talking about Barbie. A blockbuster movie that has divided the West on socio-cultural grounds, but one that's angered and offended Vietnam on a much higher level. Why? Because Barbie, as some people have said, is an assault on men, or according to another critic, is a flaming piece of dog poop, a Death Star-sized piece of drac that teaches children all the wrong things. No is the answer, Vietnam could give a rat's behind about polarizing Western world issues. What's incensed the country is an image that appeared in a Barbie scene we just mentioned featuring China's perhaps indelicate Nine Dash line. In fact, the Barbie movie is not the first film that Vietnam has banned over this line. Nine highly offensive dark dashes demarcating what critics say is China's brazen territorial claim. Malaysia and the Philippines have also banned American movies over nine dashes, a problem for Hollywood's bottom line, but a feather in the cap for China. The issue of that now infamous line has been heating up lately. It doesn't look like this story will have anything close to a Hollywood happy ending. Rather, violence is probably on the not-too-distant horizon, which, as you'll see later, has many citizens of Asian nations worried. The USA plays a major role in this existential concern, of course. We'll come back to the present scraps and squabbles soon, but first, we need to look at how this line came into being in the first place. We must ask ourselves, how can China be so bold as to claim so much of this area as its own? Are its long territory-grabbing fingers acting within their rights, or is China being the schoolyard bully of the South China Sea? First, you must understand some history to understand China's rather big claim. As some of you know, for centuries China was quite an isolated nation. It was very advanced, though. So when those first Europeans went there and marveled at various Chinese inventions, the Chinese would often refer to those Westerners as uncivilized barbarians. When those enterprising Europeans started to exploit the world's natural resources, sailing around the world to do business and often kill and conquest, China still remained mostly isolated. During the height of the European Industrial Revolution in 1820, despite the British and the rest of Western Europe churning out newfangled money-making industrial machinery, China easily had the world's largest economy. That year, the country's economy was about six times bigger than Britain's, which was the largest economy in Europe. China's economy at the time also dwarfed the USA by about 20 times. In fact, China and India at that point together made up 49% of the world's GDP. The British went on to govern India, 1858 to 1947. Some say rob India blind, but getting to China's wealth became a different kind of ballgame. Presently, China will waste no time telling the world about its superpower prowess in those days, but the country also believes the imperialists robbed it at a time when those imperialists were getting very good at making weapons. It's important to understand this widespread conviction in China when trying to understand the country's present territorial claims. In a nutshell, the Europeans weren't happy about China's isolationism. They wanted to do business. The Brits, through the East India Company, especially didn't like China snubbing trade. The Brits hated the fact that China would only sell its very popular products, such as tea and silk, in exchange for British silver. This created a trade imbalance, and one way to get around that was by illegally selling opium from British India to China. As effectively the first large drug trafficking cartel in history, the Brits went from selling 200 chests of opium a year in 1729 to 10,000 chests per year between 1820 and 1830. In 1838, Britain was selling about 40,000 chests, helped along by very dodgy Chinese officials and drug dealers in the port of Canton. Meanwhile, China had an opiate crisis on its hands that makes the US opiate crisis today look like an opiate triviality. The British were acting kind of like a big pharma slash Sinaloa cartel of the 1800s. Millions of Chinese were addicted to this old school Oxycontin. A UN report said at the height of the crisis, one in four Chinese adults were spending their days nodding out on opium. Not good for society at all. 
In short, the Chinese fought back by burning a huge amount of British opium, and after some more incidents, the two countries ended up going to war. The Europeans, with their new technologies, were certainly very advanced. Barbarians, maybe, but barbarians that could easily outclass China in a fight. The Brits by then had far superior battleships and weapons. China was riddled with corruption, official misinformation got back to Beijing, and so the Brits easily won what's now called the First Opium War. For the next century or thereabouts, Western European powers as well as Japan, Russia, and the US to some extent beat China up in a series of wars and conflicts that ended with brutal treaties now known as unequal treaties, and the superpower China gradually turned into what was called the sick man of Asia. It lost so much, including lots of territory, China was carved up and plundered. Imperialism is ferocious, Chairman Mao Zedong said years later, even if he was a tyrant of the highest order. China now calls this the century of humiliation, and often you'll hear political rhetoric in China telling people never again. For you to appreciate the present beef over these nine dashes, you have to understand that bit of history. We only gave you a small snapshot, but it'll do for now. China claims that its nine dash line, which encompasses close to 90% of the 3 million square kilometers in the South China Sea, is its own blue national soil. The country claims indisputable sovereignty over this area, based on its days as a powerhouse in the region before it started losing parts of the territory to the likes of Britain, Japan, and France. Nonetheless, you'd be within your rights to ask why China gets this territory when indeed the South China Sea is surrounded by many countries, including Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Taiwan. You need to know something about the latter. Taiwan, aka the Republic of China (ROC), was annexed in 1683 by China's Qing Dynasty, only to lose it to the Emperor of Japan in 1895 as part of the Treaty of Shimonoseki. This was another one of those so-called unequal treaties that China doesn't look so fondly upon. In 1945, the war ended and allied China retook control of Taiwan, but this time under the ROC. The ROC had overthrown the Qing Dynasty in 1911. After World War II, China, being one of the main allies, was judged deserving of a bit of territory. There were no real big squabbles when in 1947, a Chinese cartographer named Yang Huaren drew a line in the sand, or should we say the sea. Didn't really concern the West back then. China had just lost 15 to 20 million people, second only to the Soviet Union in terms of World War II deaths. This was an 11 dash line, not a 9 dash line. The reason for the two missing dashes is because of the infamous Mao Zedong who, in 1952, abandoned China's claim to the area known as the Gulf of Tonkin. The reason why Mao was in power then is that Mao's forces had defeated the ROC, which the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek headed. At the end of this brutal civil war, the nationalists, military, governance, and civilians retreated to Taiwan in their millions, an act known as the Great Retreat. They thought about coming back to reclaim China, but this plan, named Project National Glory, never came to fruition. The People's Republic of China (PRC) was staying, even if it was later weakened after Mao's crazy development plans aka Great Leap Forward and his bloody oppression aka Cultural Revolution that together cost tens of millions of Chinese lives. So there were two competing claims to China, but we should remember that it was the nationalist Yang Huaren who drew the map. When the nationalists skipped off to Taiwan, they still claimed the territory that lied within the 11 dashes that they'd drawn. Mao had nothing to do with the map when it was created. So you might ask, how did China, the nationalists or the communists, think they could lay claim to all that territory? Surely you can't just draw a map and, well, that's that. Well, China might respond, that's exactly what we did. Often Chinese scholars like to point out that it was only doing what the imperialists in the West had done for centuries. And as you now know, China in its heyday was indeed the regional hegemon. It now says it claimed these territories during that period of strength. China says there's plenty of evidence regarding its historical claims. The country was never really a seafaring nation unlike Britain and France, but China said it did do a fair bit of moving around the South China Sea. More so, it says, than the other countries currently claiming space in the water. There are the Spratly Islands, a 164,000 square mile area named after a 19th century British sea captain named Richard Spratly. Right now, there's a military presence on the 100 or so reefs and atolls, not only from the PRC but also Malaysia, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Let's now take a look at China's claim. The country says long before the British named this area, in the 2nd century BC, it named them the Nansha Islands, which became the Changsha when the Tang and Song dynasties were around in 618 to 1279. China claims it was the first country to develop some of those islands. It also says in the Guangzhou records written by the Jin dynasty, there's talk about Chinese fishermen in this area. 
China maintains that the Ming and Qing dynasties in 1368 to 1911 wrote about the Hainan Island fishermen in the area, and later they wrote about fixed shipping lanes there. China also likes to remind people that the British Navy Sea Guide once stated, Hainan fishermen dotted on every island, live on sea cucumbers and shellfish. Some of them also inhabit the islands. Then in 1933, a French newspaper says China reported, between Annam and the Philippine Islands is a group of coral islands dotted with sandbanks and submerged reefs which voyagers see as perilous and not dare enter rashly. There's also thick growth of grass, and some Chinese people from Hainan live on the islands engaging in fishing. On top of that, China says that the Cheng He navigational charts written by the Ming Dynasty record activity on the Nansha Islands. It says there are two Qing Dynasty maps, one dated 1716 and another 1817, which both include these islands. A Chinese website edited by Wang Xiaohua, vice minister of the Central Propaganda Department of the Chinese Communist Party wrote, In 1883, Germany stopped its invasion activities on the Nansha Islands in the face of protests from the Qing government. In 1933, French occupation of the Nansha Islands met with resistance from Chinese fishermen, after which the Chinese government made firm its claim to the territory, which resulted in France's eventual retreat. China says in 1946 the Chinese government, according to the Cairo Declaration and Potsdam Proclamation, regained its sovereignty over the South China Sea islands and reefs and re-erected a monument of sovereignty on the main island. China also claims that in 1951, at the time of the Japanese Peace Treaty Draft and San Francisco Conference Statement, Chinese former President Xiao Enlai was quoted saying the area within the Nine-Dash Line was China's territory. In 1958, in the Declaration on the Territorial Sea, the PRC again laid claim to these islands. We have a few things to unpack here in defense of those that say China still doesn't get to claim the territory. Many nations have texts that say their fishermen traveled through a certain area. That's not the same as having sovereignty there. There are even caves on one of the Spratly Islands that show us humans were there around 50,000 years ago. It doesn't mean they had sovereignty. And for sure, as China was easily the most advanced nation in the area, it drew up maps with the islands and talked about them, but that still doesn't mean China had sovereignty over them. Just because you draw a map and include some islands doesn't mean you own them. In fact, as China was exploring these islands, Vietnam was also in the area, claiming to have discovered these new territories. Both nations were doing the same thing. Europeans were in the area too, although when a 1758 map by a man named William Herbert referred to the Spratly Islands, it just called the area dangerous ground, and it didn't mention much else. It's true that in the 1880s when the Germans started sailing around the Spratly and Paracel Islands, the Chinese told their ships to leave ASAP. And it's true that China laid flags down on some of the islands in 1902 and 1907, but this still doesn't tell us China has the legal right to the territory. In fact, China's history shows us that the country's land boundaries were never clearly defined. The argument against China is that China, the ancient civilization of China, didn't have any clear and defined boundaries, but now it's pretending it did. That's not how China worked in the past, so why is it trying to work this way now, say the Western critics? Chinese history shows us that suzerainty was always China's modus operandi, not conquest with added new boundaries. Suzerainty, by the way, means just having control over a country or territory, even if that country has some amount of autonomy and is allowed to self-govern. For instance, China did have suzerainty in Vietnam, but it never strictly ruled it. Another for instance, in 1770, Lieutenant James Cook, the captain of HMB Endeavour, claimed part of the Australian continent for the British Crown. He called it New South Wales. He told the indigenous folks their land now belonged to the British. The King of England had told Cook to take the land with the consent of the natives, but let's face it, the natives didn't really have a say in the matter. The Brits colonized Australia. Australia was not a tributary state. Right or wrong, those imperialistic Brits did not claim suzerainty. They took Australia and later dumped many of their criminals there. They also massacred Aboriginal people whenever there was resistance to the colonization of their country. Maybe Mao was right and the imperialists were ferocious, but that still doesn't mean China gets to claim any territory where once a handful of fishermen hung out in the water. Western academics say in China there was no such thing as claiming sovereignty over an area. They say the Europeans invented that kind of thing after 8 million people died during the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. These nations introduced the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which included the Westphalian system, a system that said there should be international laws and rules, and states that have exclusive rights in their territories. Asia did not adopt the law, not until the 20th century anyway. It's the international law now, but it wasn't when China claims to have done its island hopping. 
so China, they say, never had sovereignty over the South China Sea Islands. Making historical claims based on who was there at one point in history doesn't give you sovereignty in the future. The Diplomat magazine argued that if this was the case, since Taiwan was originally settled by the people of Malay Polynesian, then the Malay people have more of a righteous claim on Taiwan than the PRC. It doesn't make sense to think this way. It would mean Mongolia could make claim to just about all of Asia. Until recently, Chinese maps didn't even focus on the South China Sea. Then, in 2009, China had a dispute with Vietnam and suddenly it took to the UN a map with nine dashes on it. These days, the nine dashes are a source of national pride. You can even find them in Chinese passports. China suddenly wants what it never initially claimed. In 2012, when these new Chinese passports came out, the government in the Philippines wouldn't even stamp visa pages and said the stamps must go on a separate sheet of paper. At the time, the Philippines was fighting with China over the Scarborough Shoal, an area where China wants air and naval bases. China's been very busy for about a decade turning reefs and shoals into fortified military bases, setting off alarm bells in the Pentagon. In China's so-called Great Wall of Sand, what were small reefs have been dredged and concreted over, after which runways at barracks and anti-aircraft weapons and missile defense systems have popped up. This concerns the U.S. more than fishing rights or oil, but the U.S. can also put pressure on countries to go against China. Then again, China can do the same, as it has substantial power in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Just recently, China and ASEAN agreed to attempt to conclude their non-aggression pact on the sea feuds for at least three years. As all you historians out there know, such feuds could escalate and lead to a potential world war. Let's remember here that in a world war, these islands and reefs could prove to be a good strategic base. It's also worth noting that about a third of all maritime trade goes through the South China Sea, equal to around 4.4 trillion of trade annually. That's another reason why the USA has been sailing ships through the South China Sea under Freedom of Navigation Operations, or FONOPS. Critics inside the US have said this risks escalation, but it seems the US is not going to stop. The U.S. has undertaken nine phone ops since 2015, which has infuriated China. By undertaking these cheeky journeys, the U.S. is basically saying China has no right to these territories. So again, these islands meant less to China not too long ago, but now the nine dashes are firmly implanted in most Chinese people's minds. They're told time and again that there will not be another period of humiliation, never again. Despite the shaky historical evidence that everything within the line is China's, the people are made to think the evidence is solid. They are also rightly concerned about their existence, which has improved a hell of a lot over the last 20 years. When Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke in March 2023 to the 14th National People's Congress, he talked about when China was turned into a semi-colonial society, when bullying foreigners plunged China into an abyss of great suffering and tore the country apart. The people listened intently. He had a point. China did get done over, but Xi's compelling rhetoric still doesn't mean China has a right to the territory. Nonetheless, China has done a phenomenal job pulling almost a billion people out of poverty since its economic boom. It's done well under its Belt and Road Initiative, spreading its influence all over the world. The US will try everything in its power to stop that influence from expanding. It's a big reason why NATO has been forming new partnerships with the Asia-Pacific nations – Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. Meanwhile, Vietnam banned Barbie, which, if there is a third world war, might go down as something similar to Hitler invading Poland or Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination. Just kidding. We hope. Vietnam actually banned the movie Uncharted, too, for the same reason. Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines all banned the innocent animated movie Abominable. The Nine Dash line barely appeared in the background in just one scene, but that was enough. They might not have the same existential fears of the US, they might have more financial concerns, although they might also be getting a push from the US. As we said, these Nine Dash line disagreements effectively kicked off in 2009. That was when Malaysia and Vietnam submitted territorial claims in the South China Sea. China made a formal diplomatic response to the UN stating, China has indisputable sovereignty over the islands in the South China Sea and the adjacent waters and enjoys indisputable sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the relevant waters as well as the seabed and subsoil thereof. This contained a copy of the Nine Dash Line to protest the Malaysian-Vietnam submission. China claimed the line was widely known by the international community. Then in 2016, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention Tribunal ruled that China's claim isn't based on any kind of international law. Even so, China rejected this ruling and it continues to do what it wants in the region. 
The U.S. has said it does not agree with China's claims, which is evident with those phone ops it's been doing, but the U.S. can't really do much about China's bullying tactics. It can't strong-arm the issue. The U.S. hasn't even put its name on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is there to deal with such disputes. The country says part of the convention is unfavorable to its own economic and security interests, but that doesn't help matters where China's island grabs are concerned. It should also be noted that the U.S. did not support the Philippines in 2016. As we said, these disputes are not only about China's expanding military installations. Countries in the region have been arguing about natural resources for years. The area is a fishing gold mine. While there's an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil down there, not to mention about 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. No wonder then that Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Vietnam all stake claims in the South China Sea. It only became known in the later 1960s that hydrocarbon resources were there, and this is what reignited the interest in the region. In May 1970, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan held talks regarding joint energy exploration in the East China Sea, and that's when China started making new claims. In 1972, the Philippines struck oil off the coast of Palawan Island. There was lots of bickering to follow, and even though in 1982 a resolution was reached under the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, it didn't really address sovereignty issues concerning the South and East China Seas. Then in 1988, China sank three Vietnamese ships and killed 70 sailors in another beef about territory in the region. China fought with the Philippines in 1996 in what was called the Mischief Reef Incident. Later in 2002, China and 10 Asian nations signed the Asian China Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea to prevent such conflicts from happening again. Further on, China signed an agreement with Japan, again related to energy, and in 2010, when China was looking like it was at the peak of its growing economic powers, the U.S. stopped being neutral regarding the South China Sea. That's when Hillary Clinton said in a speech that the U.S. had an interest in what she called open access to Asia's maritime commons. Soon after, China started building its Great Wall of Sand, and in 2015, the U.S. did its first phone ops, which China's ambassador to the U.S. said was a serious provocation. A regional dispute was now a much bigger dispute and became much more of a concern to the U.S. in 2018 when a Chinese H-6 bomber landed and took off from Woody Island in the Paracel Islands. In 2020, Vietnam condemned China when it opened up administrative structures on the islands in the Paracels and the Spratlys. Again, China just keeps doing what it's doing and throwing its nine-dash line in front of naysayers' faces. The U.S. sees China as a threat. China sees the U.S. as a threat, especially with its new NATO footprints in Asia. Unless there is some serious detente diplomacy, it's hard to see how this all won't end very badly. People in Asia understand this very well. A recent poll was undertaken by the Eurasia Group Foundation, which conducted a survey in three Asian nations, Singapore, South Korea, and the Philippines. All these nations had significant ties with both China and the U.S. Red, they'll have to take a side. 90% of respondents said they're worried about a U.S.-China confrontation, 66% were somewhat worried, 24% were very worried, 62% of all the nations said their national security will be put at risk, but 81% in the Philippines said that. Interestingly, around a third of the respondents said they have a positive view of both Chinese and American culture in their country, although some more people said they had a favorable view of the U.S. at 70% than they do of China at 34%. South Korea had the most people that said they have a very unfavorable view of China at 38%, while Singaporeans, only 10% of them, mind you, took a very dim view of the U.S. It's doubtful any of them want to be stuck in the middle of a war, but if the world can't evolve out of balance of power politics, that's what's going to happen. The massive military and economic might of the People's Republic of China is constrained by the Gobi Desert to the north, Siberia and North Korea to the northeast, Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries to the south, and India and the Himalayas to the southwest and west. Only to the southeast toward the South China Sea does China have unfettered access to the rest of the world, an access that it desperately needs for its economy to flourish. But even there, China is hampered by something called the First Island Chain. This is a chain that China wants to break through. Even if they were able to do that, they'd find themselves constrained by a different set of islands further away. But why is China so afraid of these islands, and where does the U.S. come into the equation? In 1823, U.S. President James Monroe invoked a concept later to be known as Manifest Destiny. In a speech presented to Congress in which he warned European nations, specifically Great Britain, France, and Spain, not to interfere with America's imminent westward expansion, Monroe pulled no punches as he unilaterally declared that any attempt by Europeans to colonize the American continents, as he described them, would be seen as potential acts of war. 
This dual policy of a God-given right to an American sphere of influence in North America, combined with a promise of non-intervention in European affairs, became known as the Monroe Doctrine. It wasn't until 1845 that the term Manifest Destiny would be coined almost simultaneously in two different printed publications. In the July-August 1845 issue of the Democratic Review, followed almost immediately in nearly an identical context in a July 1845 article, The New York Morning News. This term meant the inalienable course, some would argue their God-given right, to populate the areas west toward the Pacific Ocean. Following the U.S. Civil War, the Monroe Doctrine would be expanded to cover future U.S. intervention throughout Latin America and was even invoked by some politicians and diplomats to counter the Soviet Union's efforts to expand their influence into Latin America during the Cold War period from the 1950s through to the 1980s. This doctrine went hand in hand with the concept of manifest destiny and declared that both North and South America were the stomping grounds of the U.S. alone. The problem with the Manifest Destiny concept is that it completely crushed the rights of the indigenous Native Americans who already occupied those lands, as well as the Spanish settlers who had arrived centuries before the residents of the initial 13 colonies made it to mainland North America. In the words of the Cato Institute, the Monroe Doctrine, which instructed the Europeans to stay out of the Americas, was coldly and unashamedly self-interested. President Monroe laid out his position and that of future U.S. presidents with a decidedly blinkered viewpoint we should consider any attempt on their, Europe's part, to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. Monroe never mentioned how much peace and safety would be extended to the people already living in the areas that the US would eventually overrun. Today, China is facing its own moment of manifest destiny and are using many of the same self-serving arguments in order to push forward their own claims. They claim almost the entirety of the South China Sea as theirs, claiming that their trading ships back in the 16th century regularly went through these waters, which they then claim gives them exclusive rights to control the vast area. But recently, they've gone even further to solidify their claims. China's efforts to conquer the South China Sea Throughout the South China Sea, China's military has occupied a number of barren atolls and even some underwater reefs and shoals and built them up to house air bases and military ports, literally dredging up sand and rock from the ocean floor to make these islands habitable. Seven of these bases are in an area west of the Philippines called the Spratly Islands, a 175,000 square mile area with more than 750 islands and reefs that combined barely total more than three square miles of actual above surface terrain. The Spratlys are such a widely spread out island chain that they're claimed in part by six different nations – China, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Brunei. Most of the island chains are within the Philippines' 200-mile Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, while significant portions are also within the EEZs of Vietnam and Malaysia. Yet, China has decided to position permanent military bases on these seven islands that were once partly or completely underwater. These island bases are part of a Chinese effort to occupy enough territory to defend a disputed interpretation of the South China Sea known as the Nine Dashed Line. This area, extending more than 800 miles from China's coast, is significant to China's economic future. Not only are vast fishing areas and untapped oil reserves in the area, something that all six nations are fighting over, but China's economic and national interest also demand they be able to control shipping through the area. Since the 1980s, more than half of the world's supertanker traffic by tonnage passes through the region's water every year. Tanker traffic through the South China Sea is over three times greater than through the Suez Canal and five times greater than through the Panama Canal. Up to one quarter of all the world's crude oil passes through the South China Sea on its way to China, which imports up to 70% of its oil and natural gas, as well as 65-70% to of its food for its massive population. China's also been threatening military action against the island of Taiwan, which Beijing claims is now and has always been a province of China. The Taiwanese, however, don't see it that way and have clung to their precarious freedom since their government retreated there following the Chinese Communist takeover of mainland China in 1949. Taiwan, ruled by the Republic of China or the ROC, as opposed to mainland China's government known as the People's Republic of China or PRC, represents a significant link in what's known in China as the First Island Chain, stretching from Japan to Taiwan and then south to include portions of the Philippines and further south to Indonesia. This area is perceived by China with the same manifest destiny tinted glasses as theirs by ordained right, just as the US previously saw all the land between the Mississippi and the west coast as ultimately theirs to conquer and control. 
But despite all the Chinese military bluster surrounding Taiwan and beyond their efforts to occupy and conquer, there is another set of islands in the east that pose a bigger threat to China's economic future. They contain no Chinese bases, no military buildup, no ancient historical pretext of ownership, in fact nothing for which China can lay claim to, the way that they've tried to claim so much of the South China Sea. And yet, these few islands perhaps remain more of a threat to China's future than Taiwan and the Spratleys combined, and few people in the West have ever heard their names. The Worst Kept Secret Between China and the West They're called the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a mostly north-to-south oriented archipelago of around 572 islands on the very eastern edge of the Bay of Bengal. They lie only 22 nautical miles from Myanmar, also known as Burma, to the north, and 99 miles from Indonesia to the south. They've been considered part of India for centuries, at least since 800 AD, when the Kola dynasty had influence over the islands during their 400-year rule. When Great Britain subjugated India from the late 1850s through to 1947, England used these islands as a convenient penal colony. When India gained its independence after World War II, England wanted to retain ownership of the islands, but India persuaded them that the islands had been an integral part of India economically for more than two millennia and were necessary for India's defense of the Bay of Bengal and the greater Indian Ocean to their immediate west. What makes these sparsely populated islands so important to both India and China are their location. The archipelago sits strategically at the entrance of the Malacca Strait, the world's busiest shipping route. In a time of crisis, India would be able to blockade the Straits of Malacca, the Lombok Strait, or the Sunda Strait using elements of the Indian Navy based out of Port Blair in conjunction with the navies of Indonesia, Vietnam, and other Asian nations. Just as China is doing with the seven islands of the Spratly Islands, India has decided that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands archipelago would make excellent positions not just for naval support and resupply, but also as unsinkable aircraft carriers. They also have the capability to support radar installations that, with tall enough towers, can see over the horizon farther than any ship-based radar system. Relations have steadily deteriorated between India and China since a series of violent border clashes in a disputed region in the Himalayas erupted in 1957 and grew worse in 2020. Both sides want to maintain control over the vital deepwater narrows that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands protect. Military Improvements on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands Aware of the future role that the area can have in keeping an eye on China's naval force projection, India has taken steps to build up the infrastructure on the archipelago. India's Andaman and Nicobar Command ANC, established in 2001, is the only tri-service theater command, integrating air, naval, and army forces of the Indian Armed Forces. Based at Port Blair near the southern tip of the Andaman Islands Group, the command was created to oversee and coordinate India's strategic interests in the nearby Strait of Malacca to the east and the South China Sea beyond. This base allows for rapid deployment of military assets in the event of hostilities anticipated to come primarily from China. The base provides logistical and administrative support to naval ships which are sent on deployment to East Asia and the Pacific Ocean. The Andaman and Nicobar Command includes INS Jarawa, a modern naval base of the Indian Armed Forces located in Port Blair at the southern tip of South Andaman, which is the territory's only populated town. The base was commissioned in 1964 and has undergone recent upgrades and improvements. INS Utkrosh is the adjacent naval air station, which is concerned with operating defense and reconnaissance craft for the region, while INHS Don Vantari serves as a naval hospital for the base. Port Blair also has the services of Floating Dock Navy FDN-1 of nearly 40,000 tons, large enough to service all but the biggest ships in the Indian Navy, while a second smaller floating dock FDN-2 was ordered in 2010. Port Blair is a two to three hour flight from mainland India via Port Blair's Veer Savarkar International Airport and three to four days by sea to reach the eastern coastal cities of India. China's Regional Response The Andaman and Nicobar Islands aren't the only islands in the area that have seen an increase in military attention. Just off the southwest coast of Myanmar lies Great Coco Island, a small remote island only eight miles long. It's also just 45 miles north of the northern sections of the Andaman Islands. Great Coco Island, the largest part of the Coco Islands chain, has been allegedly leased to the People's Republic of China since 1994, though China calls such a claim laughable. Despite the island's tiny size and China's protestations to the contrary, it's nevertheless big enough for someone to clandestinely build a brand new 7,500-foot runway. Signs of construction have provoked concern that China, to which the military junta of Myanmar has grown increasingly dependent on following their February 2021 coup, would use the location to gather intelligence on the Indian Navy either through espionage or via a constellation of radar dishes placed there similar to the buildup on their seven contested Spratly Island bases. 
and as with China's militarization in the Spratlys, there are fears that a larger military presence will follow, using the newly installed runway and port facilities as a wedge in the door to a greater military presence needed to protect those facilities. Greater Cocoa Island and the seven Spratly bases aren't the only places where China is positioning its military to control the high seas. They've also begun building up a naval station in Cambodia at a location called Reem Base in the Gulf of Thailand, close to the strategically important Malacca Strait. As with Great Cocoa Island, China denies they're building a naval facility there, but real-time geospatial satellite surveillance is now available to refute those denials. Black Sky, a US-based persistent global monitoring service, a private satellite company not unlike SpaceX's Starlink, though on a much more specialized scale, has been able to gather intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance or ISR data on Reem Base, proving that China is building up the location with a big investment in men and material. As with the Spratlys, Reem Base will be able to support large naval vessels with additional structures still in the building phase. Interestingly, the satellite images show two piers under construction, the longest of which extends more than 2,200 feet in length, with almost 1,000 feet of usable docking space. This one pier is being developed with a distinctive angled shape, a feature not seen at every staging area, but present at China's only other major naval base in foreign waters on the coast of the African city of Djibouti. The Djibouti base was the first China built away from the South China Sea. Its construction began in 2016, during which time China protested that it wasn't building anything militarily connected there. By 2022, there were 2,000 permanent Chinese military personnel there, and their angled dock, identical to the one being built in Cambodia at its new Reem base, is deemed large enough to handle one of China's three new aircraft carriers. As with the seven island bases in the South China Sea, China first claimed its base in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa was going to be a civilian project, and denied any implication that it was going to be militarized. Djibouti is strategically situated by the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which separates the Gulf of Aden from the Red Sea, and oversees the southern approaches to the Suez Canal. The location is significant, not just to China. The US operates its own base, Camp Limonier, just to the south along with the French who have their own base Ariane 188, primarily for the French Air Force, while Japan maintains a self-defense force base Djibouti right next door. The beginning of the construction of this base in 2016 and its implications for further militarization of the region by China prompted the African Base Peace Security Council or PSC to issue a warning about allowing future foreign military bases in their countries. The council urged member countries to be cautious when entering into agreements that would lead to the establishment of foreign military bases in their country. Despite these concerns, the African continent has become a host to an increasing number of foreign military bases and logistics hubs, primarily as a direct result of trade and economic agreements between a few African Union member states and China, China's massive Belt and Road Initiative. Along with these major military bases, bases which, remember, China has always claimed weren't for military purposes until they were completed and then, whoops, they really are military bases. China is also involved in hundreds of smaller projects throughout Asia and Africa. The Belt and Road Initiative, launched by Chinese President Xi Jinping during a visit to Kazakhstan and Indonesia in 2013, was initially a two-pronged program, the Overland Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road. The two complementary sections were originally referred to as the One Belt, One Road Initiative, but eventually became the Belt and Road Initiative, known as the BRI. The BRI is a multi-billion dollar program that funnels Chinese building projects into agreeable countries. Everything from railroads and highways to complete ports and airports are built, which are then taken over by the Chinese government when the poorer countries inevitably can't repay their building loans. If this sounds suspiciously like a crime syndicate taking over a business because they can't pay a loan shark, that's because it is exactly like that. The program is currently the primary method with which China is increasing its presence around the world. In the bigger picture, this is China's global plan both for projecting power into new regions, primarily Central Asia and Africa, while also working to ensure unfettered access to the countries where it seeks raw materials. The initiative oversees a funding pool as large as $67.8 billion in 2022, which was a slight decrease from 2021. The amount funds over 200 separate projects in 147 countries, many of which are currently losing money. These losses may send several of the host countries into bankruptcy. One example is Pakistan, whose indebtedness is currently at $62 billion, of which 80% has been financed by China. This indebtedness is fueled in part by the high cost of the BRI projects combined with the high rate of interest China is charging. And here is where Djibouti returns to the picture. 
The 2018 International Monetary Fund assessment pointed out that the building program they had agreed to with China increased external debt for the country from 50% of GDP to 85% the highest of any low-income country. Much of this debt is owed to China's Exim Bank and consists of a government-guaranteed public enterprise debt for things like the new Chinese-built port. If Djibouti defaults on its debt, the contracts put in place allow China to assume ownership of the facilities. Many other BRI countries have identical clauses in their own contracts. It's not just Africa and Andaman and Nicobar Islands, though. There are worries about other small island chains seeing an undue military influence as China and India vie for regional positioning. The Maldives, a small, strategically located archipelagic nation in the southwestern Indian Ocean, lies only 370 miles from India's nearest coastline. The island nation is embroiled in a diplomatic tug-of-war between the two Asian powerhouses. While India has been conducting military exercise with the Maldives' tiny 2,500-man military, China has made its desire known to place military bases there, which India has naturally responded negatively to. The problem is that the Maldives, like many other Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean island chains, is an archipelago of low-lying islands, reefs, and atolls. According to World Bank, with the future sea levels projected to increase in the range of 10 to 100 centimeters by the year 2100, the entire country could be submerged. But as we've seen with China's creation of artificial islands, that's no deterrent to a sufficiently motivated military with deep enough pockets and sufficient dredging machinery. Despite its relatively small above-water footprint and the threat of global sea level rise, the Maldives become the latest location where both China and India want military control. In 2013, the islands saw the rise of the authoritarian Abdul Yamin, who agreed to a series of infrastructure projects as part of China's budding BRI program. By 2018, Beijing had completed a major upgrade of the Maldives' main international airport, including, as we've seen before, a new 11,000-foot runway long enough to handle the biggest of China's bomber fleet. These improvements have come at a high cost for the Maldives. China's loans have saddled the country with nearly $1.5 billion in debt, a high figure for a nation with a GDP of less than $9 billion. More recently, India has stepped in and allocated up to $1.4 billion to help pay off the country's debt. This is a similar tactic to Japan's grant of $3.4 billion to India to help them build the necessary energy grid to keep the Andaman and Nicobar Islands fully functioning. Japan sees a strong Indian presence in these islands as a vital means of reining in China's growing presence in the region. This program, launched in 2021, is expected to be completed by early 2024. India's Naval Partners The need for Japan to help India fund its control over the islands highlights what some analysts see as an underfunded state of a vital choke point. These analysts perceive that India has neglected the necessary infrastructure for the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, in part because of their 800-mile distance from the mainland. India's land-based forces have been prioritized after the serious clashes along its borders with China. Funding for the Navy was focused on strengthening India's immediate coastline defense, while the island's potential was something that would have been taken care of in the indeterminate future. However, just as Taiwan won't have to go it alone against all of China's expanding navy, India has partners on its side as well. The Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or QUAD for short, is a military partnership sometimes dubbed the Asian NATO. It's made up of the four countries of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. The QUAD's inception began with the CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which really was originally thought of as an Asian NATO by its organizers. In that respect, it was planned to be a strictly defensive organization where NATO was created to unify defense against Soviet Russia's expansionist aims, CETO was similarly created to coordinate a united defense against perceived Chinese aggression. Following the massively destructive 2004 tsunami that ravaged many Indian Ocean countries, the U.S. set up a working group of nations to coordinate disaster relief to the hardest-hit areas, including India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. This core group that would oversee relief efforts included India, Australia, Japan, and, of course, the U.S. The Quad members reiterated support for the principles that underlie a previous regional group known as ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Their principles for free trade and unfettered access to the world's oceans, as well as mutual economic and diplomatic ties, were more easily implemented by those four major economic powers. Their leadership would strengthen engagement with other ASEAN organized efforts, including the ASEAN Regional Forum and the annual East Asia Summit. Just as the U.S. would not be denied its vision of manifest destiny, there is every reason to believe that China will continue to operate in the same way. The U.S. had a problem early in its history that China does not currently have. That is, when President Monroe foresaw the continent fully under American sway, he didn't have the military might to back it up. 
However, China has a growing and modernizing army and navy, with a nuclear missile stockpile that's increasing almost as fast. While other countries like Japan, Australia, and India are trying to keep pace, China has gained economic and diplomatic partners in their race to build military bases in many far-off locations, including Africa, Central Asia, and potentially even South America. China has already spent more than a billion dollars on their Belt and Road Initiative, which is designed to link together many of the countries that they'll need to supply them with the raw materials their country will need well into the rest of the 21st century. If India wants to put a collar on this new dragon, then the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will be one significant part of that collar, but they won't be able to stand up by themselves against the massive military might that China possesses. They'll need the assistance of its regional allies, especially the three other members of the Quad, Japan, Australia, and of course the United States. Sources within the Department of Defense estimate that war with China is inevitable and likely to happen within 18 to 24 months from July of 2023. While the war will be costly, there's one undeniable fact. China is terrified of the U.S. Navy. But it doesn't mean that America will win. In any confrontation between the U.S. and China, it's both sides' navies who will do the bulk of the fighting and decide the very fate of the Pacific and beyond. If China wins, its authoritarian model will spread around the world as it uses its global near-monopoly on semiconductors to bend nations to its whim. Think you're safe in Europe? Until Macron figures out how to run sensitive electronics off of croissants? Think again, because even our European cousins' fates are intertwined with America's struggle with China in the Pacific. America's win conditions for any war with China are resolute. Nothing less than the total destruction of the Chinese Navy and the Chinese Air Forces will do. While America isn't seeking confrontation, it has stated goals of what it will accomplish if it happens. The U.S. will not broker any chance of a resurgent China challenging it again two decades later, in the style of early 20th century Germany. Thus, the U.S. will seek to absolutely smash China's ability to project power past its own shores. Standing firmly in the U.S. camp are Japan and Australia, and heavily favoring America, as well as treaty-bound to help defend it, are the Philippines and South Korea. That leaves China as the outlier in its own neighborhood, as every significant power on its block has opted to throw its lot in with the U.S. And while a comparison of both sides' navies is important, what's even more important is that the U.S. will not be fighting alone. If China chooses to go to war, it'll be stepping into a cage match with no friends. Well, maybe North Korea, if it's feeling particularly suicidal that day. So what does the tale of the tape tell us? One-on-one, -on -one, the American and Chinese navies are the two most powerful naval forces in the world. China has pulled off nothing short of an economic and industrial miracle, growing its navy in 20 years from a brown water force incapable of challenging a single U.S. carrier strike group directly off its own shores to one that'll soon be a bona fide blue water navy capable of global operations. In numbers alone, China fields 730 ships versus America's 484, though these are not all fighting ships, as both navies have about as many support vessels as combat vessels. However, when it comes down to fighting ships, China outnumbers America. The Chinese have 78 submarines versus America's 68, 50 destroyers versus America's 92, 43 frigates versus zero for the U.S., 72 corvettes versus America's 22, and 150 coastal patrol craft versus the U.S.'s 10. The only categories the U.S. outnumbers China is in aircraft carriers with 11 versus 2 and amphibious assault ships, sometimes known as light carriers, with 9 versus 3. The Chinese Navy has more combat hulls than the U.S., prompting the Secretary of the Navy to comment that the U.S. desperately needed to increase the size of its fleet, coupling his statement with the bad news that America cannot keep pace with the Chinese shipbuilding. However, that's not the full story because when it comes to tonnage, the U.S. Navy has nearly twice the tonnage of the Chinese Navy, and that matters when a significant amount of that tonnage comes from 11 American supercarriers, each fielding a small air force that on their own would be a formidable challenge for most nations' own air forces. The fact is, the U.S. has fatter ships than China, which means they can take more punishment, have more capabilities, and field more weapons. Five years ago, the U.S. had nearly tripled the number of battle force missiles than China, a total count of every type of missile a warship could carry. By 2030, China will have closed that gap significantly, but the U.S. is still estimated to have a 50% lead. However, China is not resting on its laurels, and while the Pentagon wants 350 manned combat ships by 2045, China is projected to have 460 by 2030. The rate of production in China is incredible, with China pumping out about 20 warships a year, while the U.S. struggles to get six out. It doesn't help that China has 13 shipyards, and most of them have more capacity than America's eight shipyards. Just one has more capacity than all of American shipyards combined. 
But that's not the full story. During the Cold War, after all, the Soviets had a larger navy than America, but nobody would have ever argued the Soviet ships and submarines were an equal match to their American counterparts. The US is a firm believer in quality over quantity, and historically this has proven to not just be a war-winning strategy, but one that delivers extremely lopsided victories. While the newest batch of Chinese destroyers are featuring better radars than those present on older US hulls, the overall advantage is still squarely on the American side. The US also fields more and better missiles than China, and on a platform-to-platform -platform basis the advantage is almost always heavily in America's favor. But the US isn't resting on its heels, and the Navy has an ambitious program to tackle the numbers disparity between the two sides through technology, of course. Currently, the Navy is testing a variety of unmanned vessels that will one day soon be complementing U.S. task forces. Already, the Navy is using unmanned drones for aerial refueling of its combat aircraft, which frees up platforms which would normally be reserved for the role, increasing the overall power of each carrier's air wing. But soon drones will be doing everything, from patrolling for enemy submarines to carrying out mining or demining duties, engaging in suicide attacks against high-value targets, and possibly even serving as nothing more than floating arsenal ships, drone platforms with as many as 500 vertical launch cells that will simply follow US fleets around until they're needed to engage targets. America is betting big on unmanned tech to level the playing field between the two sides, because while having bigger, more capable ships is good, it also means that that the loss of each individual ship is a bigger proportional loss of combat power. What if war broke out today, though? The regular and naval air forces of both sides would play heavily in any conflict in the South Pacific, and while China has made great strides, US air forces still leave it in the dust. In 1996, most of the Chinese Air Force was made up of hopelessly obsolete second-generation aircraft, either direct purchases from the Soviet Union or copies produced under license or simply reverse-engineered and stolen by Chinese engineers. Today, over half of Chinese Air Forces are made up of fourth-generation platforms, with a growing fleet of fifth-generation J-20s, of which China is estimated to have around 200. To be fair, the J-20 is widely considered to be more of a four-and-a-half than a true fifth-generation design, as there are multiple features, such as canards, that are decidedly unstealthy. Much like the Russians, the Chinese have also found it difficult to master the production techniques required for the incredibly tight tolerances necessary for fifth-generation airframes, evidenced by visible seams in the aircraft's body panels which would increase its visibility versus radar. Materials technology also lags behind the US and the West overall, as does the development of advanced avionics and other sensors. Lastly, the J-20 has underpowered engines, as China has struggled to develop native engines that can match the performance of American engines. And it's not just sheer power, it's efficiency and reliability. One American F-16 pilot remarked how when speaking with Chinese pilots, they expressed shock and surprise when he informed them of his flight around the world in his F-16. Chinese engines are notoriously unreliable, and it's estimated that the Chinese would only get a few hours of combat time out of each engine before needing serious maintenance. As it stands, Chinese jet engine reliability is about one quarter of American or European jet engines a significant problem. Underpowered engines have also hamstrung the development of a true carrier fighter, with China's J-15 Flying Shark incapable of lifting the type of loads an American F-18 would, limiting either combat range or armament. China's engine problem stems from its history of imitating rather than innovating. Its most advanced engine, the WS-15, began development in the late 1990s and took flight in 2022 with a J-20. However, the engine has shown significant reliability problems as China copes with the power requirements of modern fighters. And that's a problem China is trying to correct by building relationships with foreign manufacturers and universities as it attempts to improve its human capital by sending students and trainees abroad. The United States has recognized this tactic and worked to limit the access Chinese students have to its aerospace industry and educational programs. Manufacturing is also a significant problem for China, as the world's most advanced machine tools are all foreign-made. China can source components for its engines on its own, but it relies on Western, Japanese, or Korean machines for manufacturing. Chinese aerospace firms are forced to import machine tools from German, Japanese, Italian, and South Korean firms, and this poses a critical 
risk to China when Russia couldn't match the West's 5- and 7-axis machine tooling capabilities in the early 1990s and early 2000s, demand for its defense products shrank considerably. These high-precision machine tools are critical for the development of advanced aircraft structures, compressor blades, and inertial navigation systems. China is also struggling to figure out how to optimize its manufacturing process, and has been attempting to steal secrets from the West for years. In 2018, Chinese-American Zhao Qingjiang was convicted by the Department of Justice for stealing trade secrets regarding turbine sealing. Chinese intelligence officer Xu Yangzheng was discovered to be targeting experts from Western aerospace companies and plying them for sensitive manufacturing data and attempting to get them to speak to their Chinese counterparts to improve Chinese efficiency. Despite plenty of theft of intellectual property, the country is basically built on it, the one thing that China can't steal is expertise and its native workforce lacks the decades of training and experience to properly implement the stolen knowledge. That situation is unlikely to change anytime soon, as China historically has a significant problem attracting talented immigrants. On an airframe basis, though, the US has a significant advantage over China, with a completely modern fleet that sees ongoing modernization efforts through either upgrade programs or the acquisition of new aircraft like the F-35. It's no secret that the US absolutely loves its air forces, and it fields nearly twice as many fighters as China does. It also has seven times as many special mission aircraft critical for modern success than China does. Notable mentions, however, are the F-22 Raptor, which blows the J-20 out of the sky, literally, if it ever came down to it. The Raptor is facing a modernity problem, as its old architecture makes it prohibitively expensive to significantly upgrade its electronic brains, but it's still significantly more lethal than anything in the Chinese fleet. Even China's most advanced balloon technology is no match for the deadliest plane in the sky. The Raptor's ever-evolving little brother, though, is what China should be the most worried about. The F-35 is not as stealthy as the Raptor, but what it lacks in stealth it more than makes up for in literally everything else. The aircraft is designed from the ground up to be a true 21st century weapon. It features high levels of automation unmatched in any other platform, which lets the pilot focus on the job that matters, killing bad guys or avoiding being killed in return. A system of distributed cameras also allows its pilot to look through the frame of his own aircraft, giving him unparalleled situational awareness. But the F-35's real strength is its ability to speak with other weapon systems in the U.S. arsenal, in effect making it a miniature airborne air traffic control. It can even guide the weapons fired by other aircraft or surface platforms to their targets, allowing it to use its stealth to penetrate into airspace that its fourth-generation cousins couldn't, while guiding their long-range weapons to targets it can see. But the U.S. isn't done there, because even before the F-35 fully replaces that F-18 fleet, the U.S. Navy is already designing its next-generation naval fighter. This sixth-generation aircraft is pure speculation at the moment, though the Air Force has confirmed that its own version has already been flying for about two years. What we do know is that the Navy wants to have a much greater range than either the F-18 or F-35, a greater payload capacity, and it needs to come with the capability of flying alongside drone wings men. With Chinese anti-ship missiles and ever greater concern for the U.S. Navy, future fighters will need to operate from carriers based further from hostile shores, necessitating a greater fuel capacity. Drone wingmen, meanwhile, will enable various capabilities on attribute platforms, which right now would need to be undertaken by expensive manned aircraft. Drones, for example, could use their own onboard radars for situational awareness, while allowing their manned mothership to keep hers powered down and retain her stealth. When it comes to hitting where it hurts, China has developed an impressive array of long-range anti-ship missiles. The YJ-12 is the primary weapon used by China's bombers and its large array of coastal missile batteries, with an estimated range of about 300 miles. It's a subsonic weapon, though, and thus vulnerable to robust American air defenses. Though an ability to conduct a supersonic sprint in its terminal phase increases its lethality. The YJ-18 is the primary missile used by China's submarines and surface warships and is capable of being fired from vertical launch cell systems. It features a range of about 330 miles and is also a subsonic weapon with the ability to perform a supersonic sprint in its terminal phase. The YJ-83 is fielded on Chinese attack aircraft and smaller surface warships. It only has a range of 110 miles and is a purely subsonic weapon. This is the equivalent of bringing a knife to a gunfight, though, and it's unlikely any Chinese aircraft or ship could survive within 110 miles of a large American surface action group. The DF-21 and DF-26, however, have been termed carrier killers and are truly up to the task, at least on paper. 
These large ballistic missiles are launched from land-based platforms and feature a range of 930 and 1850 miles respectively, putting even targets far out at sea at significant risk. They are hypersonic weapons, though only in the sense that they are ballistic missiles which reach hypersonic speeds. Being ballistic weapons though, they fly in a predictable path, making them vulnerable to US air defense missiles. China's only modern hypersonic anti-ship missile, the YJ-21, was only revealed in 2022. Details about this weapon remain shrouded in mystery, but China claims that it's a true modern hypersonic weapon defined by the ability to maneuver at hypersonic speeds, something ballistic missiles can't do. It's this maneuverability and extreme speed that makes these types of weapons so dangerous, as it makes intercepting them incredibly difficult. However, the YJ-21 has not been deployed in large numbers, and its capabilities, range, and lethality are completely unknown. What is known is that modern hypersonic weapons are incredibly expensive, and it's not economically possible to field them in large numbers. That's why the US has dropped some of its own hypersonic programs, opting instead to increase the penetrability of its next-generation conventional missiles. The US has relied on the Harpoon anti-ship missile for decades. A Cold War stalwart, the Harpoon is a capable weapon, but one that faces increasingly more sophisticated air defenses. This is why the US Navy has begun fielding a completely new weapon, its first new anti-ship missile since the Cold War, and it's planning to field them in large numbers, with producer Lockheed Martin opening a second production line to make both the long-range anti-ship missile or LRASM and its air-launched variant used by both the US Air Force and the US Navy, the Air-to-Air -air Standoff Missile Extended Range, or jasm -er. With things heating up in the Pacific, the US has realized that its current stockpile of anti-ship missiles will likely not be enough for a protracted conflict. Now Lockheed Martin is projected to be building 1,000 LRASMs and JASMers a year. These advanced weapons feature stealth characteristics that significantly reduce an enemy's engagement time, increasing the probability of penetrating air defenses. However, being stealthy weapons means they're limited to subsonic speeds, but that also means that they use regular jet engines rather than rocket motors, which greatly increases their range compared to Chinese missiles. The JASMer is specially designed to be launched by aircraft well outside of China's increasing anti access area denial capabilities, estimated at over 575 miles, or over twice that of the El Rasm. But the US isn't completely out of the hypersonic game, despite scrapping their air-launched rapid response weapon. Instead, it's focused efforts on building an air-breathing hypersonic missile named the Hypersonic Air-Launched Anti-Surface Warfare, or HALO missile. Still deeply in testing phases, the aim is to produce a financially responsible hypersonic weapon that can be built in significant numbers, a true challenge for any hypersonic weapon. As the El Rasm builds in numbers though, the Harpoon is receiving upgrades to make it more relevant on modern battlefields. Its Block 2 Plus upgrade includes a new GPS receiver and flight control system which will help it find targets in a complicated environment, as well as a two-way data link to allow it to be retargeted in flight, and an infrared seeker for all-weather capability. However, the Harpoon is old tech, and Navy war games show it which is why the El Rasm is being rushed into production today. With a host of new weapons on the way and significant legacy capability receiving upgrades, the US Navy is a terrifying force to reckon with even given China's superior numbers. More importantly, the US will not fight this war alone and can count on a number of allies and partners to shore up its own numbers. In the end, that is the secret to the US's true lethality and a capability that no amount of espionage or industrial theft will ever deliver to China. In the 1984 film Red Dawn, the beleaguered Wolverines, teen partisans defending the middle of America against a Soviet and Cuban invasion, ask a downed US fighter pilot, played by Powers Booth, what started the war. His answer? The two toughest kids on the block, I guess. Sooner or later, they're gonna fight. That's the way many analysts see the current situation between the United States and its allies, primarily NATO, and China and its main military ally, Russia. With all the military spending on both sides, it only seems inevitable that they will eventually use the power they've built up to forward their global agendas. The current situation between the authoritarian East and liberal West has not been this tense in about half a century. The invasion of Ukraine has brought NATO and the United States into as close to an all-out hot war with Russia as we've seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis. But with that previous series of events cooled off before shots fired, the Ukrainian war has seen hundreds of thousands of casualties. Russia feels that many of the deaths on their side are due to the military and economic aid sent by NATO and the US to Ukraine. Putin and his political henchmen have repeatedly threatened NATO with nuclear weapons 
if they feel the existence of their country is threatened any more than it already is. Matters weren't made any better when Great Britain almost had one of its RC-135 reconnaissance planes shot down in September 2022, which would have raised tensions even more. There was another close call in November of 2022, when an errant Ukrainian air defense missile missed its intended target, another Russian missile barrage indiscriminately targeting Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, and landed in neighboring Poland, killing two people. NATO has a very specific section of its agreement called Article 5, which states that any attack on a member nation is an attack on all of NATO. For a moment, talks of all-out war between Russia and NATO filled the blogosphere. Russian officials have sought to paint NATO as aggressors in the war, continually claiming that the poor little Russia was directly fighting against the massive enemy of NATO, while the US and its allies have said they are supporting Ukraine's defense with military aid and unspecified intelligence sharing, but not with boots on the ground. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, China continues to make threatening gestures toward Taiwan, including recent armed jet intrusions of Taiwanese airspace following Speaker Pelosi's trip to the island in 2022, and then Speaker McCarthy's trip in 2023. Following the more recent April trip, China effectively closed Taiwan's airspace with waves of fighter jets and for the first time made it seem like they were able to interdict any U.S. support from the east of the island. There is even talk that China might begin to require ships transiting the Taiwan Strait to undergo boarding and searching, which Taiwan says they will vigorously oppose. Are we close to a hot war? First off, let's make one thing clear. The U.S. and China are not on the verge of war. On March 31, 2023, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, said, I don't think at this point I would put the possibility of imminent war in the likely category, and I think that the rhetoric itself can overheat the environment. However, General Milley did admit that it is possible that you could have an incident or some other trigger event that could lead to uncontrolled escalation, so it's not impossible. That incident would most likely evolve around an attempted Chinese invasion of Taiwan. President Xi has publicly stated that he wants the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, to be prepared to take Taiwan by force as early as 2027, so that risk clearly does exist. Let's take a look at the two main theaters of such a potential war. NATO and the European elements of the United States' forces arrayed against Russia, and the US forces in the Pacific, mostly naval forces, against the might of the Chinese Army and Navy. Of course, such a comparison will not include the opposing nuclear forces. Any of the combatants have enough warheads to turn vast swaths of the world into unlivable nuclear wasteland. For the purposes of this comparison, we will hope that all sides would agree not to resort to such catastrophic weapons. The Opposing Military Strengths in Europe before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most of the world perceived Russia as the second most powerful military in the world. They had massive numbers of tanks and artillery, their air force was seen as a peer with the American Air Force, and their navy was capable and feared, even if it didn't have comparable numbers to the US Navy. Russia's military fiasco in Ukraine has proven their tanks are outdated and poorly designed, their logistics vanish once they leave their rail network, and their air force has been fragile enough that they don't dare fly over Ukrainian territory for fear of being shot down. The only two legs of their military that remain unbowed by these defeats are its artillery, still numerous though notably inaccurate, and its nuclear forces, which remain unused and still unproven. As of April 2023, the widely respected research organization Oryx has documented and confirmed an astounding 10,000 vehicle losses by the Russian armed forces, including over 1,900 main battle tanks, half of what it reportedly had pre-invasion, along with 830 armored fighting vehicles, 2,200 infantry fighting vehicles, 800 pieces of artillery, 79 aircraft, 81 helicopters, and 12 surface vessels, including the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Slava-class guided missile cruiser Moskva. This this is in addition to an estimated 200,000 Russian military casualties, with anything between 45,000 to 50,000 killed in action. These numbers are incredibly high from just over a year of fighting, and are far greater even than what Russia suffered in its 10-year losing war in Afghanistan. The losses are so high that in early 2023, Russia began returning 75-year-old T-54-55s into service, the equivalent of the US using Korean War-era M47s. The Russia also lost a reported 1,500 officers, including 160 top-level generals and colonels, and it's clear the once-feared Russian military is a shell of its former self. Standing opposite the vastly depleted and shaken Russian military is NATO, now more united and stronger than at any time in its 74-year history. With Finland's admission into NATO in April of 2023 as its 31st signatory nation, the organization can now boast a combined troop strength of just over 3.5 million soldiers, airmen, and sailors. That includes, however, the US and its 1.4 million strong standing army, not all of which would be fighting in Europe, 
and Turkey's 425,000 not the most committed of NATO's members. That means the rest of NATO's 29 members contribute only 1.7 million troops total. France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Poland, and Italy each have 160,000 or more active personnel, while other countries have smaller forces to rely on. It must be stated, though, NATO considers itself a defensive organization. How involved they'd be beyond their own borders is anyone's guess. It's important to note that the current war in Ukraine has shown that the NATO members, mostly led by Poland and the US, are willing to supply lethal aid from missiles to artillery to tanks and fighter jets to a non-signatory nation whose defense is of a vital interest to nearby NATO members. Since Russia launched its invasion in February of 2022, NATO members have increased both their military budgets and pledged a greater amount of military spending per capita. They've also benefited from sending Ukraine their Soviet-era tanks and fighter jets, which have been replaced with upgraded models, many of them being state-of-the-art models from other member nations, like the US's F-35 stealth fighter and M1A2 Abrams tanks. NATO can also count on around 1,500 Leopard 2s and about 2,500 M1 Abrams main battle tanks, the majority of which are M1A2s, with the rest being the earlier M1A1s, with an additional 800 or so British Challenger 2s and French Leclerc and Arietes. And while the number of aircraft on both the NATO and Russian sides appear about equal, NATO forces employ more 4th and 5th generation fighters like the F-35 and the improved and updated versions of the F-16. While Russia is still reliant on more outdated MiG-29s introduced in 1982, MiG-31s introduced in 1981, and the Su-27s introduced in 1985. These three plane types alone account for more than 750 of their total 1,100 available pre-invasion fighter aircraft, a disproportionate number of outdated and non-modernized platforms. And as has been seen in Ukraine, many of these aircraft have not been maintained sufficiently in order for them to be combat ready anytime soon. It's clear that a war between only the European forces of NATO and the struggling military of Russia would be a one-sided affair. But how would China fare against a mostly US force? The Opposing Forces in the Pacific China, it should be obvious, has not suffered from an equivalent loss of military strength as Russia has over the past year. In fact, the modernization and expansion of its military has been impressive and has caused its neighbors like Japan, Australia, India, and the Philippines to increase their own military expenditures. Yet China is still missing major components that will allow it to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the US Navy. These missing elements suggest China would be better off waiting at least five years, and possibly as much as ten years, before it initiates an open military confrontation with the West. For example, the People's Liberation Army Navy, the PLAN, currently operates 25 of its modern 10,000-ton Type 52D destroyers, with its own version of the Aegis Type radar system, along with eight of the more advanced 13,000-ton Type 55A destroyers, along with six of the earlier 7,000-ton Type 52C ships. There are up to 12 additional destroyers currently under construction. But while these ships are designed specifically for missile and aircraft defenses, they've yet to deploy with the planned HQ-26 medium-range ship-to-air missile system, which was based on the Russian 9K-37 Buk, first developed in 1972. This new missile system is reportedly equivalent to the US SM-3 missile used by the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System and was expected to be able to engage short and medium-range ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and both manned and unmanned aircraft out to 400 kilometers. However, this capability is expected to be implemented around a year or two from first deployment and will be even longer before it's deployed fleet-wide. Until then, China's missile defense destroyers like the Type 52 and 55 will have to make do with the upgraded HQ-16B with a reported maximum range of only 70 kilometers, a system that dates from 2011. The biggest weakness in the plan, of course, is its aircraft carrier fleet. They currently operate three carriers, the oldest being a 90s-era Ukrainian-built Russian-designed ship named the Lao Ning with its ski jump ramp, which is also a staple of its second carrier, the Type 002 Shandong. The Lao Ning isn't really considered a frontline carrier and is relegated to the role of training carrier. Its third carrier, the Fujian, currently being fitted out, is equipped with advanced electromagnetic catapults, similar to those on the US supercarrier USS Gerald R. Ford, some say copied directly from it. But that means the plan will have to train its carrier pilots on two types of takeoffs, and that will need two different types of carrier planes to operate on those carriers. Its current training model, the JL-9G, a single-engine twin-seat aircraft first deployed in 2011, can't be used to duplicate emergency landings on any of its current carriers because it's too weak to take the continual pounding of carrier landings, and it's too underpowered to immediately take off in case of a missed landing. That leaves only simulated takeoffs and landings on ground-based 
based mock-ups. This inability to field a true carrier trainer has led to a huge deficit in trained carrier pilots. The problem with the planned trainer is just the opposite of its carrier combat aircraft, the J-15 Flying Shark, which was mocked by Russia for trying to be a back-engineered version of a Su-33 prototype, the T-10K-3, which they bought from Ukraine back in 2001. At a reported 17.5 tons, its upgraded version is now thought to be the world's heaviest carrier-borne fighter. In comparison, the U.S. Navy's F-A-18 weighs only 14.5 tons. The J-15 suffers from either having to carry less than optimal fuel, giving it less range, or less armament, giving it less lethality, if it intends to take off from the two ski-jump-equipped carriers. It has since been nicknamed the Flopping Fish by the normally reserved Chinese press for its underwhelming performance. China's begun deployment of the Chengdu J-20, somewhat comparable to the US's F-22 stealth fighter, and have produced around 200 of them, but this aircraft cannot be adapted to carriers and remains a standard land-based air superiority fighter. China hopes to make up the difference in carrier forces with hypersonic missiles, though their reliability and readiness is still under discussion. At present, there's speculation but no confirmation that China is building a fourth carrier, though at least one recent satellite image suggests a fourth might be under construction. But the plan doesn't have enough carrier pilots for its two current frontline carriers, let alone a fourth. In comparison, the U.S. currently operates 11 carrier strike groups, each of which is comprised of one of its nuclear propulsion Nimitz or Ford-class supercarriers able to field 70 to 80 aircraft, one or two Ticonderoga-class Aegis-guided missile cruisers for air defense and coordination, two LAMPS-capable warships focusing on anti-submarine and surface warfare, and two to three Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyers. Each strike group is accompanied by assorted logistics and support ships and an undisclosed number of nuclear-powered attack submarines usually one or two, that coordinate with each strike group. The new Ford-class supercarriers currently in use by the U.S. Navy are undoubtedly the most powerful warships ever produced, with one in service and four more planned or currently under construction to be delivered between 2024 and 2034. There are literally no carrier groups of such lethality in any navy in the world, though the British and French navies do have their own carrier battle groups with somewhat comparable strengths. The U.S. also deploys several amphibious ready groups built around the WASP-class amphibious assault ships, in essence a small carrier, which can handle six fighters like the F-35 Lightning II and up to 24 helicopters like the Cobra gunship and the VF-22 Osprey transport vehicles. The amphibious ready groups also include a landing platform dock ship LPD, from the San Antonio class, capable of deploying up to 600 troops and 14 amphibious assault vehicles and a landing ship dock LSD, like the Harper's Ferry class and the Whidbey Island class landing ships, which can load and unload conventional landing craft and helicopters. These amphibious ready groups can also launch dozens of autonomous drones like the X-47B. Normally two to three ARGs are forward deployed, one in the Mediterranean Sea or the Persian Gulf slash Indian Ocean region, and one or two in the Western Pacific Ocean area. Currently, one ARG is based out of Sasebo and Okinawa, Japan. The ARGs are usually attached to a carrier strike group which provides protection for them from both land and sea-based attacks. The U.S. can also count on 26 Los Angeles-class, 3 Seawolf-class, and 21 Virginia-class nuclear-powered attack submarines, as well as dozens of ballistic missile submarines, each with ICBM-capable launch tubes. On the other hand, the plan operates 6 Shang-class nuclear submarines and 40 older diesel-electric submarines of much lower capability. Many experts point to the plan's superiority in total numbers of ships over the U.S. Navy, 340 to 300, but we must consider that the plan's numbers include 150 patrol craft, which are more equivalent to the U.S. Coast Guard's cutters, designed for coastal engagements only, and not really capable of the kind of blue water combat the main naval units would engage in. In addition, while the U.S. Navy appears perfectly capable of handling the current plan on its own, any shooting war will likely involve other countries that are either wary of or outright opposed to Chinese naval power projection, including Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and India. Following continued efforts by China to claim the entire South China Sea as their own personal swimming pool, each of these countries has begun to beef up their own naval might. Japan, for instance, is building two of the largest destroyers in the world. At 20,000 tons, they dwarf even the U.S.'s 16,000-ton Zumwalt destroyers. These will complement and support Japan's two new Izumo and Kaga carriers, converted from previous helicopter destroyers, and will operate the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter. Once complete, the two carriers will be Japan's first since the Second World War.
Along with Japan's increasing naval might, Australia has entered into a long-term agreement with the US and Great Britain to build a fleet of state-of-the-art nuclear-powered attack submarines. India has also increased its own naval strength, while the country is still aching from violent confrontations instigated by China along its northern Himalayan border. China's true Achilles heel. And that brings up the most crucial component of any possible shooting war involving China. The fact that the country must import 70-75% to 75 of all their oil and natural gas through a long naval route from the Baltic through the Atlantic and past Africa, India, and Indonesia. If the US or its Pacific allies wanted to interdict the flow of petroleum to China, and such a lengthy supply chain would be impossible for China to protect, then China would be looking at a three-month delay before its countrywide truck transport system would shut down due to a lack of fuel, and six months before it ran out of the necessary components for the production of fertilizers which its farmers desperately need. Their economy would collapse within a year, and massive famine would break out even if they did manage to hold off the superior US Navy. This dramatic and inevitable failure of their economy and the catastrophic famine that would follow might be the main reason why China isn't looking to launch a full-scale war anytime soon. Not only is it a heavy importer of raw petroleum, it's also the world's largest importer of food. Between 2000 and 2020, the country's food self-sufficiency ratio decreased from 93.6% to 65.8%. China's leaders know that if it cannot win a war outright in a very short period of a few months, and the vast capabilities of the US Navy, let alone its numerous Pacific allies, suggest that this just isn't a reliable possibility, then they are dooming their country to losing their position as the second most powerful economy in the world, with a disastrous famine soon to follow. The lessons of the Ukraine war are also a stark reminder that a determined, well-equipped country, no matter how small, can resist an invader far more easily with today's advanced technological weapons. And while Ukraine has done a phenomenal job in gaining that capability in a mere eight years since the first Russian invasion of 2014, Taiwan has been preparing itself for a Chinese invasion for more than 70 years. They're also a much more technologically capable nation and have a large 80-mile moat of an ocean that China would have to navigate in case of an invasion. This would not be an easy cross-border incursion that Russia attempted and failed, but it would require dozens of landing craft, easy targets for missiles and waiting artillery. The Fragility of a Russia-China Alliance In addition to the logistical problems of overcoming the US Navy and the watery moat around Taiwan, China faces another hurdle, the weakness of any long-term alliance with Russia, an alliance that would merely be a castle built upon sand. Any full-scale war short of a nuclear engagement would find Russia's military virtually destroyed within the first few weeks of the conflict's launch, leaving China virtually alone. The Ukrainian invasion has spotlighted why Russia is nowhere near the military peer to the US, China, or even NATO that people thought it was. As previously mentioned, the Russian armed forces have lost over 10,000 military vehicles, including upwards of 1,900 main battle tanks, along with around 200,000 troops. The main reason they threaten the West so often with nuclear weapons is because they know they never stand a chance against the combined forces of NATO, which have more advanced equipment and better trained troops, and now might actually hold a numerical advantage as well. There are multiple reasons for the failure of the Russian military. First and foremost is the endemic corruption that riddles every layer of the Russian government, including the military. There are estimates that corruption has cost from 25 to 30 percent of Russia's total annual GDP, and the sanctions Russia has endured since the start of the war has caused a massive drain of its remaining economy. Not only is Russia's economy collapsing due to the surprisingly efficient Western sanctions, but that smaller economy's spending on its military is actually much less than the projected numbers. The sanctions have also shrunk the Russian economy to the size of Italy, and now puts it behind the individual states of California, Texas, or New York. Russia's nominal $1.4 trillion GDP is minuscule when compared to the EU's combined economic strength of about $15.28 trillion. Add the US and the EU's GDP together, you get about $35 trillion, more than 40% of the total world GDP. Russia will simply never be able to outspend the EU and its NATO counterpart, much less the US and EU combined. Second, Russia's never had a coherent NCO training program. Russia has lost at least 150 officers of colonel rank and above simply because their orders have to be passed almost directly from the leadership to the frontline troops. 
The members of NATO, the US, and even China understand that the sergeants and other NCOs have to have the independent authority to assess the war from the front lines and make immediate and effective changes in response. Russia has never had that level of independence, which leads their military to dogmatic, inflexible attacks that usually require masses of tanks, waves of infantry, and massive artillery bombardments, none of which are effective in a modern battlefield environment that is overwatched by drones, surveillance satellites, and reconnaissance planes. Third, Russia has never had the ability to manage their logistics at any distance from their rail network. The ignominious 40-mile-long traffic jam north of Kyiv from late February to March of 2022 was one glaring example of how their military cannot perform the simple task of keeping their tanks and transports full of fuel and moving. This lack of logistics has been further exacerbated by the introduction of high Mars long-range rocket artillery systems, which can hit targets over 50 miles away and newer smart ammunition including ground launch small diameter bombs GLSDB, which can hit targets 93 miles away. These have been used to great success by the Ukrainian forces against Russian depots that have often been placed too close to the front, mostly due to their lack of logistical transport capabilities. The Inherent Weakness of an Unequal Partnership there are additional signs that China is aware of Russia's much weaker role in any potential alliance and has been capitalizing on this inequality for some time now. At first, it was the Soviet Union that held a predominant role in any bilateral negotiations, allowing them to bully China into accepting unequal agreements. Things got so bad that the two countries almost launched a major war over a border dispute in 1969, one of several border disputes between the two countries since the 1920s. But Russia eventually decided it was better to arm the Chinese government in order to have an ally against the West. China, however, decided on its own that it'd be better to copy and or steal whatever they could get, rather than pay the full price for products coming from the Soviet Union. Starting in the 1990s, China has openly copied or stolen Russian technology, leading at times to Russia having to swallow their pride as China sold knockoffs of their own frontline equipment. For example, in 1996, China debuted the J-11 aircraft, the first fighter made after the fall of the Soviet Union to feature significant Russian input. At first, it was an officially licensed Chinese-made copy of the Russian Su-27 multi-role fighter, whose sales were welcomed by the cash-poor post-Soviet state. Before long, however, China canceled their agreement and began producing the aircraft independently eventually building over 400 unauthorized J-11s, equaling an economic loss to the USSR of more than $10 billion. Russia continues to sell its best or almost best military gear to China, even though they know the technology is likely to be copied, reducing what little technological superiority Russia still maintains over China. The policy dilemma has been compounded by the post-Ukraine effect on Russia's struggling manufacturing sector, which has left the shrinking Russian economy increasingly reliant on China's much larger economic base, further eroding any remaining compatibility in their relationship. More recently, President Xi has tried to bring China to the forefront in worldwide diplomacy. So when the UN held a vote to condemn the Russian invasion, China surprisingly abstained from the 141 to 5 vote to condemn the invasion, and in fact was a key leader of 34 other countries who also abstained. This was the first time that China had a chance to publicly support their, quote, partner, and they openly refused. This hands-off approach demonstrates China's desire to maintain its currently neutral stance regarding the Ukraine war in hopes of trying to establish Beijing's bid for global leadership. But they can't do that if they supply lethal aid to Russia, so they refuse to supply such support, despite Putin's pleas to the contrary. When President Putin and Xi met in Russia of March 2023, Putin had hoped that Xi would offer a deal to create a direct pipeline between the two countries, making China more reliant on Russian crude oil and natural gas and giving Russia a direct buyer for their primary export. But no such agreement was reached. Xi did say publicly that China and Russia would continue to resolutely uphold the fundamental norms of international relations based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. But that statement blatantly ignores the illegality of Russia's invasion in the first place, which directly violates the Charter's core precepts. Putin's hopes for any concrete agreements for aid or mutual development never materialized. The summit was summed up by historian Sergei Rachenko with an old Chinese proverb, loud thunder but few raindrops. He then modified that statement as, scratch that, even the thunder wasn't all that loud. In fact, the Putin-Xi meetings actually caused further support for Ukraine, as Japanese Prime Minister Kishida used the opportunity to make a surprise trip to Ukraine to meet with President Zelensky. Despite Xi's efforts to lead China into a role of peacekeeper and world negotiator, he still has to deal with the hawks in his own government. On the heels of the Moscow summit, the Guangming Daily wrote an extensive article, more of a semi-official position piece declaring the Ford knows that China says they will not put up with. 
Number 1. The U.S. should not make irresponsible remarks on normal exchanges between sovereign states. Number 2. The U.S. should not compare China-Russia relations with a small circle of U.S. allies. Number 3. The U.S. should not undermine China's efforts to promote peace talks on the Ukraine issue. Number 4. The U.S. should stop using the Ukraine crisis as an excuse to attack and sanction China. Some of this rhetoric is no doubt simply strong words, but they may also signal an effort to lay the groundwork for China to ramp up its military support for Russia's war, though so far there's no evidence of that. It gets worse for Russia. In addition to everything else that bodes ill for Russia, President Xi might not be willing to go all in on supporting a leader of Russia whose future appears very uncertain. Putin's been rumored to be in ill health for years. He was filmed walking with a limp when he visited Crimea in March of 2023. And in April, there were widespread reports that he had suffered from intense head pain, a numb tongue, and blurred vision. There have been numerous indications he might be suffering from Parkinson's disease, which manifests as an uncontrollable shaking in the extremities, primarily the hands and feet. And there are additional signs he might be undergoing chemotherapy, which can result in excessive weight gain. There's also signs that Putin has killed off anyone near him that might pose a threat to his continued dominance of the Russian government. Since just before the invasion of Ukraine, over 40 of Russia's top managers, businessmen, and high-level officials have died under unclear but very suspicious circumstances. Those deaths include being found in apparent murder-suicides, like Vladislav Aveyev, vice president of Gazprom Bank, and his pregnant wife and 13-year-old daughter who were found dead in a Moscow apartment, while a former top manager of Novatech, Sergei Protosenya, was found hanged at his villa in Spain, with his wife and 18-year-old daughter also found murdered in the house. And Pavel Pshelnikov, director of communications at Digital Logistics LLC, a subsidiary of Russian Railways, supposedly shot himself at his home in Moscow. The deaths have become so numerous that one media source has given the wave a nickname, Sudden Russian Death Centrum. But by and far, the most conspicuous means of death has been the archaic mid-18th century habit of defenestration, that is, falling out of a high window. Ravel Maganov, vice president of Luke Oil, fell out of one at the Central Clinical Hospital of the Presidential Administration in Moscow, and in February 2023, Marina Yankina, head of the Financial Department of the Defense Ministry, was found dead after supposedly falling from a 16th floor of her apartment. Even when a suspect is in government custody, their lives aren't safe. Most recently, Igor Shikurko, deputy general director of firm Yakuchkinerka, was discovered dead of unknown causes in his cell in a detention center in Yakut, Siberia on April 5, 2023. The extremely high number of potentially murdered rivals paints Russia in a bad light, an unstable dictatorship afraid of its own best and brightest while making enemies of its own nascent leadership. Couple that with Putin's rumored ill health, and it's just one more reason why President Xi may want to wait a year or two before cementing any permanent relationships with whoever's in charge in Russia post-Ukraine. What will Russia and Ukraine do? China and Russia are in an unenviable position. Both countries are seeing an inevitable shrinking of their populations, with China admitting an overcounting of its population during the last census by as much as 100 million. The Pew Research Center forecasts a decline from 1.4 billion people this year to 1.3 billion by 2050 and a staggering reduction to below 800 million by 2100. That's according to the UN's medium variant, or middle-of-the-road projection. Russia's upside-down population pyramid is no better. They're already experiencing a massive brain drain as a repercussion from its Ukraine fiasco, which was followed by as many as 400,000 young men who left to avoid the first conscription call-up in September 2022. Combine that with an aging population, a lower birth rate, and a decrease in life expectancy of 15 years since early 2022, and Russia's population is in freefall. Both these troubled countries might believe, then, that their only window to have enough young males to support a war is rapidly shrinking. That leaves Putin and Xi with a difficult, if not impossible, decision. Launch a war now that they're not ready for and probably can't win, or wait a few years when their populations and economies are even less capable of enduring such hardships. It's an unenviable decision for any leader to make. All eyes are on the Russian bear as it marches across Eastern Europe. But is the bigger threat to the world hiding in the East? Is China actually plotting to take over the world? As a president famously said, that depends on your definition of is. There's no question that China is a massive world power. In fact, depending on your standards, it might be only the second superpower in the world after the United States. It's the most populous country in the world, with over four times the population of the US. It has the second largest economy of the world, the third largest country in size behind Russia and Canada, and is one of only a small number of nuclear powers in the world. It's certainly the biggest power in Asia, and it might have much bigger ambitions than that. But what are China's actual plans for the world? 
To find that out, you can look close to home. The province of Hong Kong, which was a British territory for decades, was handed back to China in 1997 after negotiations which created a plan of one country, two systems. Hong Kong would be allowed to maintain its autonomy and run itself as a democracy, while China would administer certain larger affairs and it would officially be part of the larger country. That was the system for a while, until China decided it wasn't anymore, and the People's Republic of China has been tightening the screws ever since, and China has been through plenty of changes itself. Since China became a communist country in 1949 under Mao Zedong, it's been a dictatorship, but Mao's strict adherence to the communist dogma, which led to brutal famines and repression, have long since been replaced with a very different system under Deng Xiaoping and the current leader Xi Jinping. The country kept its autocratic system of government while replacing its economic policies with a sort of hybrid government-controlled capitalism. Under this system, China's economy has exploded and has become one of the world's largest producers of electronics, appliances, and mined rare earth minerals essential for manufacturing. But in other ways, China's modernization did not bring good things. While China is only loosely a communist country now, their security state is still very similar to what it was under Mao, only with a high-tech twist. In the modern age, governments use the internet heavily to gain intelligence on potential threats. That's true in China and in most other countries, with powerful tech companies turning over information to the government as needed. In China, websites like TikTok contain extensive tracking software that the Chinese government uses for unknown purposes. And internally, China has become notorious for its social credit system. This ranks citizens based on their perceived loyalty to the government and their conduct in other ways, with various privileges being granted only to those with higher social credit scores. And if you're under China's thumb, there is little you can do to escape. Hong Kong was given guarantees of a certain level of autonomy for a specific term, but in recent years those guarantees have been largely overrun. While they still have separate elections, Chinese authorities increasingly interfere in them and disqualify or arrest candidates who oppose the People's Republic's policies. This often leads to largely unopposed elections, and the recent COVID shutdowns led to China getting even more directly involved in shutting down protests and public gatherings. So, if you're inside China, you're probably kept under a pretty tight grip. But what if you're outside it? That depends on where you are, because China has been involved in a territorial conflict near its borders for almost 70 years now. When the People's Republic of China took control, it was in the middle of a brutal civil war. The communists ultimately won, but the forces of the Republic of China managed to consolidate their forces on the island of Taiwan and hold it, essentially creating a new country there. The only problem is, China still refuses to recognize Taiwan as an independent country. In fact, while they claim they're the legitimate government of Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, now a democracy, still claims it's the rightful government of mainland China. But the People's Republic has much more power, and they've managed to use diplomatic pressure to prevent international recognition of Taiwan as a United Nations member state. And they're not afraid to punch back against big targets. China takes it as a personal offense when anyone recognizes Taiwan as being independent, even if that person isn't actually the head of a country. That's why most US politicians have avoided paying visits to Taiwan in the last few decades, to avoid causing any diplomatic crises for the president. But in 2022, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and some other members of Congress decided to make a visit to the island nation, and China responded hard. They stepped up military drills around the island, terrorizing the citizens, and one Chinese propagandist even said the country should shoot down Pelosi's plane. While clearly that would have started a hot war between China and the US, and cooler heads prevailed, it was clear China was willing to escalate in a hurry. But is China all talk and no action? That depends on where you look. While they get a lot of attention for their over-the-top online personality, with colorful propagandists spreading conspiracy theories and trying to meme, they actually do maintain a very strong deterrent against international criticism. And it's one Russia is fond of as well. China's justice system is notoriously harsh, with long sentences and the death penalty on the table for many crimes, far more than murder or treason. And while most of the people in Chinese prisons are Chinese, they have commonly arrested people from other countries for the purpose of prisoner exchanges. When the CEO of Chinese company Huawei was arrested in Canada, it wasn't long before a Canadian citizen was arrested in China on drug charges. But China's reach is growing fast. No one knows exactly what China's long-term plans are. The People's Republic has made many claims about invading Taiwan, and they're no doubt looking closely at Russia and Ukraine to see how that would go but it's not going well for Russia. Most of the world has committed to supporting Ukraine with military and financial backing, and Russia has found itself increasingly isolated and sanctioned. 
While Taiwan isn't universally acknowledged as an independent country the same way Ukraine was, the United States has promised to defend it, so any sort of hot war on the island would likely escalate quickly with potential nuclear consequences. So China might be taking a slower, more global approach. China's internet efforts go far beyond an army of internet trolls, and they might just be becoming the world's most premier cyber hacking organization. While they're certainly not sharing the details of their operations, it's believed that they have three divisions of cyber warriors, specialized military forces that train in cyber attacks and work on behalf of the government, state workers who aren't in the military but are tasked with cyber warfare and spying, and a group of non-government workers who are likely hired by the government and have more deniability when they need to break into rival governments' networks. And they've caused a lot of damage. Who has China hacked? Who haven't they hacked? Countless countries have claimed that Chinese hackers have taken classified data. Australia claimed that a 2013 attack accessed the blueprints of their intelligence headquarters, while Canada reported in 2011 an attack compromised multiple federal departments. Japan has reported at least 200 cyber attacks on Japanese companies and scientific institutes, while China's frequent rival India reported multiple denial of service attacks that may have come from agents of the Chinese government. Ukraine reported attacks during the opening days of the war, maybe China acting on behalf of Russia, and even the Vatican reported hacking attacks. The US has been the top target of Chinese cyber attacks for a long time, with reports of attacks on military, government, commercial, and industrial organizations. Even the largest companies in the world aren't safe. Google was hacked in 2010 and reported that the privacy of its users was compromised. They also went after massive companies like military contractor Northrop Grumman and manufacturing giant Dow Chemical. An attack on Yahoo might have had less implications for national security, but they probably got a good look at your mom's emails, including that extended exchange with a Nigerian prince. So what does China actually want with all this data? Well, if you ask them, they'd say, we don't know what you're talking about. No cyber hacking here, as they proceed to hack another company. And because China refuses to fess up to its cyber hacking efforts, it's hard to say what they're actually after. While they hack private companies, it might be Chinese-style capitalism at work, stealing trade secrets so they can give them to their own companies, allowing them to produce lower-cost remakes of major US products, giving them a leg up in the market. They may also be looking for key access to diplomatic cables in their hacking of government institutions. But cybersecurity experts worry about a much bigger threat. If China knows how to get into the mainframes of major companies and government institutions, then they might be looking for a way to turn them off. And if they were ever to initiate war over Taiwan or another country, being able to kneecap the US's military and civilian infrastructure at exactly the right moment could give them the edge they need to finish the job. But is China actually planning a big move? If they are, they've been putting their pieces on the board for a long time. China has a long reach in Asia that goes far beyond Taiwan and Hong Kong. They unilaterally claim sovereignty over the entire South China Sea, which puts them into conflict with Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. China's claim means that they have the authority to stop intelligence gathering activities by foreign militaries in the sea, which has led to multiple near misses between Chinese aircraft and those of other countries. The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines during a recent dispute, and China's response was to reiterate its claims and continue its campaign of harassment. So why does China want this territory so much? Some people think it's just maximalism. After all, if you claim the sea surrounding a bunch of countries, it's really not a big reach to then claim those countries. But the ocean itself is incredibly valuable, with an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil and almost 200 trillion cubic feet of natural gas hiding far below the waves. If China manages to get the world to accept their authority over these islands, they would have a huge leg up in energy production, something they very much need with their massive population and energy needs. This area also has multiple highly sought-after fishing areas, which would give China the food it needs without having to rely on imports. And more importantly, they would control access to the food of many poorer countries who would have no choice but to align with them. And when you can't find a beachhead, why not make one? China has been known to take over small islands in the South China Sea, but they've started taking another approach, building artificial islands in the South China Sea that let them create unchallenged military staging grounds. These islands are typically built on rocks or reefs that are close to the surface of the water. After dredging the area to create a more solid floor, they're covered with harder material and turned into small military bases. This turns the disputed sea area into what's de facto Chinese territory, and serves as an act of intimidation against any other country that tries to set foot in the area. But is China a threat to the region? So far, China seems to be trying to win through soft power rather than open military action. They're hands down the biggest military power in the region, which means that any other country is likely to back down 
when directly challenged. While North Korea and India are also nuclear powers, North Korea is typically aligned with China, and India is preoccupied by its conflict with Pakistan. China's tensest relations in the region are with Vietnam, which it fought wars with previously. Now the two communist countries have hit rough waters, with China increasingly encroaching on Vietnam's coastline in the South China Sea while harassing Vietnamese ships. In 2014, China began building an oil rig deep within Vietnam's ocean territory. China seems to be making itself a regional power through sheer force of will, but elsewhere it's taking a very different approach. There's no continent more open to realignment than Africa. Historically, the subject of colonialism, occupation, and a brutal slave trade. Many of its nations only gained independence in the 20th century, often at the conclusion of bloody wars. Now, while many of the countries do have good diplomatic relations with Europe and North America, there are naturally old wounds to heal. And that's why China sees the continent as a massive opportunity for expansion. But this time, they're not looking to intimidate their way into a seat at the table. They're looking to buy their way in. Chinese investments in Africa have gained a lot of attention in recent years as the country moves many of its manufacturing efforts there. Africa is far away from China's expansionist actions in the South China Sea, and as such, many African countries are neutral to China. So when a Chinese firm shows up looking to build a factory there, they're likely to be approved. And China knows how to sweeten the deal. They'll frequently build new housing or other infrastructure as part of their investment, creating potential loyalists down the line should the world divide between China and the US. And for China, investing in Africa just makes sense. Many people see Africa as the future of the world. Not only is the population of the region expected to double in the next 30 years, the highest growth of any continent, but seven of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are located there. That makes Africa the world's best place for future investments. And China has made it clear that they're not just restoring the old dynamic of Africa being used as a looting ground for world powers. They frequently staff their companies with African workers, providing jobs to the local economy, although they tend to be low-skill and low-paid jobs, while Chinese figures hold the higher positions. But is this good or bad for Africa? Some worry that China is setting Africa up for what's called a debt trap, where they invest heavily in a country in exchange for promises of repayment of the investment, only for the profits to never come and the country to be stuck in a state of limbo. That hasn't happened so far, as it doesn't seem like China simply wants to extract resources or money from Africa, they view it as a diplomatic investment as well. China wants to control the tech infrastructure in these countries, bringing industry to many of them for the first time. If China was to go to war with the United States and NATO, those countries would find themselves potentially cut off from a massive infrastructure network as China had commandeered it. One of the biggest concerns about this effort is that the heavy industrialization in African countries is hurting their environment, but the governments in most countries seem excited for the investment. But is there a longer plan at work here? China seems to have a hand in just about every region, similar to the other superpowers of the past and present. For Europe and North America, they mostly have cautious diplomacy and an aggressive cyber hacking strategy to gain intelligence. For the neighbors in Asia, they approach with belligerence and flex their muscles to claim territory. But for nations in the so-called third world, there's often an outstretched hand instead, offering heavy investments and possibly an alliance against the older powerhouses of the world. And some think this might be all coming together for China to make a big move. Many people have said the 21st century could be a Chinese century with the country's economy growing by leaps and bounds. But they've been hit hard by their efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to economic slowdowns. Additionally, they've lost many diplomatic allies in the West due to their aggressive military tactics and their domestic policies, particularly their internment of the massive Uyghur Muslim population and their treatment of other minority groups like Buddhists and the Falun Gong movement. That's kept their growth in check, with many Western countries becoming more hesitant to invest heavily there. Which then leads people to worry, are they biding their time for a military move? China is incredibly powerful militarily, maybe the second strongest military in the world. While Russia has the most nuclear weapons of any country, its weapons are old and unreliable to the point where no one knows how many would even fire. China is estimated to have only 350 nuclear weapons, a far smaller arsenal than the US, but every single one of them is in working order, and many are attached to powerful missiles that could hit just about anywhere in the world. They're also one of only a few countries to have aircraft carriers, and their naval and aerial fleets are believed to be competitive with the US's fleet. But their biggest weapon might be how prepared they are. So if China was planning to actually take over the world, how would they go about it? The first step would likely be to plan with some other countries. China has become one of Russia's few remaining allies since the war with Ukraine, helping them get around sanctions and providing vital economic help. So if China wanted to make its own move on Taiwan, or a much bigger plan, it would likely pull in Russia for help. 
A coordinated attack on several targets might be much harder to coordinate, and they might have a third partner as well, North Korea, run by the infamous Kim Jong-un. Like China and Taiwan, North Korea has never accepted the independence of South Korea even after 70 years. A three-pronged attack like this might take the world by surprise. But would they actually win? In terms of a full military invasion, we've seen how Russia has performed and North Korea has never been tested against a military outside its peninsula. But China's naval fleet is fearsome, and many believe it could fight the US fleet to a standstill in the Pacific. And when you have two nuclear powers standing off shooting at each other, there's always the risk of escalation. China could not win a nuclear war with the US, but a major nuclear exchange would likely mean neither country is left standing. So China is hoping to avoid nuclear war, and it might have a plan to do so. Could China win a war without firing a shot? This might be where China's cyber hacking infrastructure comes into play. Unlike other military attacks, hackers don't announce themselves. They sneak in under the cover of darkness. Imagine if one morning America woke up and nothing was working. The internet was down, smart devices were malfunctioning, and even the government's connections weren't working. They spend hours getting things up and running, and tune into the news to find out that Chinese warships are shelling Taiwan. Their military has established beachheads in Vietnam and the Philippines, and North Korea has crossed the DMZ. While the fighting is far from over, China has declared their invasion successful and says that any interference from the US would be an invasion of their territory. Surely the United States would arm up, right? Not so fast. Maybe China calls in its chips with Africa and cuts the US off from several key suppliers. Supply chain issues are a bane of Russia in the Ukraine war, and the United States might now face the same problem. China would have cut off its supplies, as will any country aligned with it. More critical and occupied Taiwan would no longer provide America with the key semiconductors it needs to operate much of its technology, and the United States would have to think twice before expanding key military technology. While South Korea's fearsome military would likely be able to hold off North Korea for a long time, and China would likely rein in the North to keep them from using nuclear weapons, it's unlikely that Taiwan or Southeast Asian nations could hold out too long without support. But is this where China would want to stop? Taking over much of Asia has been China's goal for a long time, and if this plan would work, it would have pulled it off without getting bogged down in a global conflict. This would firmly entrench it as a superpower and make the United States look toothless. More countries would be looking to align with China, and that includes India. China's goal would likely to be to turn India into a regional client state rather than actively trying to conquer it, and with Pakistan on one side and China on the other, they could put a lot of pressure on the subcontinent. Smaller nations in the region would likely choose to align with China for protection, and China's next big step would be to expand further out into the Pacific. Many small island nations there could be pressured into signing deals, giving the Chinese free reign in exchange for protection, and that might bring China into direct conflict with the United States. While most Pacific islands are independent nations by now, the United States has several territories including Guam and American Samoa. While they're unlikely to try to annex any of them outright, at least at this stage, they would likely start treating them in a similar way to the way they did Vietnam initially. They would just step on their sovereignty as much as they want and dare them to respond. Would the United States tolerate this? That depends on the political climate at the time. How much hunger does the US have for a conflict with a rival superpower? Does the public agree with defending these islands, or do they leave them to their fate? If they're left to their fate, that's another blow against the United States' standing in the world. And the next on the chopping block is Hawaii an actual state but located thousands of miles away from the mainland. With a strong independence movement, could China make inroads there? So China's plan may not be to conquer the world in a shock and awe military campaign against the most powerful armies in the world, it might simply be planning to expand its power and influence piece by piece until it stands alone as the most powerful superpower in the world. Coconut trees, mangoes, and precision bombers. These are just a few things the Philippines brings to the table if China invades Taiwan. The Filipino and United States governments have come to an agreement that will allow the US to expand its military presence to the northern islands of the Philippines. This deals a huge blow to any plans Beijing might have for invading Taiwan. But the Philippines isn't just a vital strategic location to launch a military mission against China from, it also offers several other advantages. There are over 7,000 islands in the Philippines, and China should be nervous about each and every one. The United States has five treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific, Australia, South Korea, Japan, Thailand, and the Philippines. However, if a conflict between China and Taiwan arose, the Philippines would be a stone's throw away from the front lines as its northernmost island is only 118 miles or 190 kilometers away from Taiwan. 
and if Beijing decided to go full-blown Russia and invade a sovereign nation, the Philippines will almost certainly play a major role in the conflict in several ways. The Philippines would react almost immediately to an invasion of Taiwan, not because they necessarily want to protect the island, but because there are an estimated 200,000 Filipino nationals living and working there. The contingency plans are already being formed on how to bring every Filipino home if China invades Taiwan. But Philippine involvement in a conflict in the South China Sea doesn't stop there. In recent months, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. and his administration have been strengthening ties with the U.S. in case China tries to move on Taiwan. In fact, during a visit to Manila on February 2, 2023, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin declared that American commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. Our alliance makes both of our democracies more secure and helps uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. This announcement was a major cause for concern in Beijing, and it came as little surprise when Mao Ning, a spokesperson for China's foreign ministry, responded to Austin's statement and the expansion of U.S. bases in the Philippines. Mao stated this is an act that escalates tensions in the region and endangers regional peace and stability. Regional countries should remain vigilant about this and avoid being used by the U.S. This rhetoric of destabilization whenever China feels threatened or needs to voice its displeasure over the actions of the U.S. is common. However, rather than blatantly stating that this new agreement between the Philippines and the U.S. is a way to keep Beijing in check and act as a deterrent to their aggression towards Taiwan, both countries state that military bases in the Philippines are just a continuation of the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement signed in 2014. This agreement was put in place to allow for combined training exercises and joint operations that were put on hold during President Rodrigo Duterte's administration when there were discussions of reducing the Philippines' reliance on the United States and forging close ties with China. It's clear today that Bong Bong Marcos wants to return to the days where the Philippines had a stronger alliance with the U.S. We'll dive deeper into the complex relationship between the U.S. and the Philippines later on. However, it's important to remember that the U.S. colonized the Philippines in 1898, and by its very nature colonization led to the exploitation of the Filipino people and unethical power structures being put in place. But unfortunately, the Philippines has a long history of being colonized by different outside forces, which is one of the reasons why they've kept such a close eye on the situation developing with Taiwan. If China were to attack and seize the island nation, the Philippines could be next, or at the very least, be forced to become submissive to the growing influence of the Chinese government. But this also goes the other way. Beijing has been keeping a close eye on the Philippines as its islands and close ties to the U.S. may pose a serious risk to their future plans. Let's break down the four reasons why the Philippines is complicating China's plans to invade Taiwan and examine how this might prevent World War III from breaking out. Reason 1. Military Intervention If China ever does invade Taiwan, it'll be a difficult battle to win. This is because the island nation has been building up its military and preparing for the possibility of invasion for decades. However, if China launched the full might of its military against Taiwan and no other countries intervened, they would likely be able to capture the island given enough time. That being said, the invasion would be incredibly costly in terms of lives lost and resources expended, but the sheer size of the People's Liberation Army would allow China to eventually break Taiwan's defenses and secure the island. However, an invasion of Taiwan will not happen in a vacuum, and this is where the Philippines is becoming a major problem for China. The Philippine military itself is not the most formidable force in the world. It only has around 100,000 active members, which is significantly less than the approximately 2 million active personnel that the PLA has. The Philippines Air Force consists mostly of cargo planes, with only around 25 attack-type aircraft at its disposal, which would have no effect against the almost 1,200 fighters China has. The Philippine Navy is mostly composed of patrol ships, two frigates, and a corvette. China, on the other hand, has the largest navy in the world, with around 50 destroyers and two aircraft carriers at its disposal. So China is not worried about the Philippines' military intervening in their plans to invade Taiwan. What they are afraid of is the fact that the recent agreement between the U.S. and the Philippines will allow the U.S. military to operate more effectively in the region. And if the People's Liberation Army went head-to-head -head with the U.S., they would lose every time. Therefore, the Philippines and its proximity to Taiwan may be one of the biggest complications in any future plans Beijing has for invading the island. The United States now has nine bases in the Philippines thanks to the new agreement, which would greatly improve its ability to deploy aircraft and naval vessels to the South China Sea and the Strait of Taiwan. This will improve American resupply and operational capabilities in the region. It's suspected the U.S. forces will immediately begin using these bases for training and equipment storage while simultaneously improving their infrastructure. 
new runways are being built along with other facilities necessary to strengthen the U.S.'s position. With each new base, China's hopes of securing Taiwan without American intervention is slipping away. There are three main advantages that the new bases in the Philippines give the United States, which are three causes for concern in China. The first is the U.S. military will be able to increase the amount of training they can conduct in the region. It also means that other U.S. allies like Australia, Japan, and South Korea may also be able to join in more training missions as well. The more preparation and exercises the U.S. and its allies are able to conduct in the region, the more effective their forces will be in a conflict. Being able to practice maneuvers and tactics in the very location where a conflict might arise gives U.S. forces a huge advantage, and this is all thanks to the Philippines. This factor is particularly important for the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Marine Corps Aviation, which will now be able to easily conduct exercises utilizing tactical air formations necessary to be effective in an East Asian conflict. The Philippine bases will allow more frequent training, and although there's no real substitute for actual combat, U.S. military personnel now have the ability to train in the actual environment they would be fighting in if China ever invaded Taiwan. The experience in Asian combat environments that U.S. troops are now gaining is making Beijing incredibly nervous and putting a real damper on any future plans they had of invading Taiwan. The second reason the bases in the Philippines are a major complication for China is that the U.S. can use them as forward operation bases to project power into the South China Sea. The facilities in the Philippines will allow the U.S. military to procure supplies, conduct repairs, and carry out maintenance on its ships and aircraft. This will provide the U.S. with the opportunity to always have a fully functional force ready to strike at any given moment. One of the things that China previously had going for it, if they decided to invade Taiwan, was that the U.S. was on the other side of the Pacific, and their bases in the region were some distance away from Taiwan. Now, however, the United States has several bases just over 100 miles from the island, and as the infrastructure is modernized, it could lead to U.S. forces being able to stay fully equipped and operational throughout a prolonged conflict. By allowing the United States military to operate freely and have nine bases in the Philippines, Manila has provided the means for the U.S. forces to grow exponentially in the region. This has not only angered China but has them terrified. Beijing knows that it cannot win a war against the U.S., which is why they've been using gray zone tactics to weaken Taiwan and bring the island under its sphere of influence. However, this may no longer be enough, and any immediate plans to take Taiwan are now under serious threat because of the Philippines and the U.S. bases there. The third and most obvious reason why the U.S. military presence in the Philippines is complicating China's future plans is that the new bases will allow U.S. forces to launch attacks across the South China Sea and target Chinese forces on the mainland. This would only happen if a full-scale war broke out, but it's the fact that the Philippines will act as a launch pad for combat operations that really has China scared. What it comes down to is that China is concerned about the continuously encroaching presence of the United States military in East Asia. Filipino and U.S. forces have already conducted joint combat exercises and disaster training in the Luzon Strait, the body of water that separates the Philippines and Taiwan. But now these exercises come with a new threat for China. The Filipino and U.S. militaries are clearly planning to defend Taiwan, which will be much easier with new bases in the northern Philippine Islands. However, it's worth noting that the Philippine construction prohibits the basing of nuclear weapons within its borders, so at least that's one thing China doesn't have to worry about for the time being. Reason 2. Economic Opportunity it's no secret that China has spread its influence around the world through trade agreements, shipping, and investment in foreign infrastructure projects. Beijing has been able to manipulate leaders, influence decisions, and sway international sentiment thanks to its rapidly growing economy. China's economic might is its main tool for spreading its power across the planet. However, nations that have closely allied themselves with the U.S., especially in Asia, are a thorn in Beijing's side. The Philippines definitely falls into that category. Over the past decade, China has been the largest foreign investor in the Philippines. However, Chinese companies are still nowhere near as dominant as U.S. companies are in the country. American companies continue to be the top taxpayers in the Philippines and have contributed more over the years than any other nation to its development. That being said, many U.S. companies take advantage of the cheap labor and loose regulations in the Philippines, but just in terms of economic impact, U.S. companies have more invested than China does. 
During the Duterte administration, China hoped to weaken U.S. influence over the Philippines and control the country through economic means, as it's done with so many other nations. Unfortunately for China, they did not succeed in this endeavor. China still has companies and major investments in the Philippines, but the new administration is clearly looking to strengthen economic ties with the U.S. Manila and Cebu are two major trading centers in the region, and there are huge profits to be made by foreign players who utilize those ports. China is now worried that on top of its military expansion, the United States could use the Philippines to further its economic influence over East Asia. The U.S. has allocated more than $82 million for infrastructure improvements in the Philippines to enhance the access to resources and the capabilities of their bases. This is a huge investment that will bring jobs and economic growth to communities around the military facilities in the Philippines. This is exactly what China has done in other parts of the world with growing economies. It's allowed them to hold power over other governments and influence their decisions. Unfortunately for Beijing, the Philippines will not be another one of its puppets. China invested heavily in the Philippines over the last decade, and now with a renewed alliance with the United States, their investments won't yield the results they had hoped. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Beijing expected one day to control the Filipino government through trade agreements and debt. Perhaps then China could have swayed Manila to support its claims that Taiwan was its territory. At the very least, Beijing hoped that its economic influence would keep the Philippines out of any conflict that arose in the South China Sea. However, this tactic has clearly not worked, which has the Chinese leadership worried. Reason 3. The Philippines is in a unique position to provide humanitarian aid to Taiwan. In the event that a conflict does erupt in the South China Sea, the Philippines will likely see an influx of refugees. This is not ideal for China's plans, as Beijing likely wants to subjugate the Taiwanese people so that the manufacturing capabilities of the island can be maintained once the invasion is complete. Taiwan manufactures over 60% of all semiconductors in the world. This has resulted in the small island becoming an economic powerhouse. However, the fact that the Philippines is so close to Taiwan and Manila has shown in the past that they're willing to take in refugees, Beijing may be nervous that unless they can blockade the entire island of Taiwan, huge amounts of talent and manpower will flee to the Philippines. If China attacks, there will be a mass exodus of Filipino nationals back to their homeland. With them will also come millions of refugees. Taiwan has a population of around 23.35 million people. It's very likely that much of that population who tries to flee will escape to the Philippines. There's also the fact that the United States military will be stationed in the Philippines to help with the refugee crisis and offer aid, housing, and services to those fleeing the Chinese invasion. The fact that the Philippines is in a unique position to aid the Taiwanese people by taking them in during an invasion is probably an annoyance for Beijing. The whole point of their gray zone tactics is to isolate and alienate Taiwan from the rest of the world. However, knowing that the Philippines and the U.S. forces stationed there would be willing and able to help the people of Taiwan as they fled for safety is just another complication for China's plans. Reason 4. The Philippines Could Threaten China's Influence in the Region this is probably at the bottom of China's list of worries, but it is worth noting that the Philippines economy is growing fast. In the last two decades, the GDP of the Philippines has jumped from $94 billion to $394 billion. That's an average growth of around $15 billion annually. Over the last several decades, the Philippines' GDP growth rate has been around 5.7%, which is much higher than most countries around the world. However, China's annual GDP change has averaged around 8.7%. Even still, the Philippines' economy appears to be growing at a steady pace with no signs of slowing down. The economic success likely put the Philippines on China's radar in terms of countries to watch out for. Any threat to Beijing's power and influence in the region is not to be taken lightly. A rapidly modernizing Philippines is not something China is happy about since Manila is so closely allied with the U.S. As of right now, China is more concerned about the military aspect of the Philippines-American agreement. However, in the future, the economic implications of a growing Filipino economy may be an additional cause for concern. Now let's dive into the history of the Philippines and how the U.S. ended up with so many military bases on its islands. Unfortunately, the Filipino people have been mistreated by a number of nations when colonized, including the Spanish, Japanese, Americans, and even China. However, understanding the past can also help us better understand the power dynamics at play today. It'll also provide a glimpse into why Beijing is so concerned with how things in the Philippines are unfolding. In April of 1898, the Spanish-American War broke out. After only months of fighting, the United States Navy destroyed the Spanish fleet stationed in Manila Bay, causing Spain to cede the Philippines to the U.S. It was at this point that the United States declared military rule and the American colonization of the Philippines began. 
The following year, General Aguinaldo declared the island should be free of foreign control and renamed the First Philippine Republic. He waged war against the American colonizers, leading to the Philippine-American War. After three years of fighting, the U.S. forces were victorious and the war ended. A U.S. civil government was installed. In 1935, political movements led to the establishment of the Commonwealth of the Philippines. The United States promised the country full independence within 10 years. Unfortunately, this freedom never came, as in 1941, a new colonizer took control of the nation. World War II was in full swing. Japanese forces invaded the Philippines and seized the northern islands. Atrocities occurred, including the massacre of entire towns and villages. It's estimated that as many as one million Filipino civilians died during the Japanese occupation. By 1944, U.S. forces reclaimed the island, and in 1946, the Republic of the Philippines was granted full independence. However, the U.S. military never really left the islands. In 1947, the United States was officially granted military basing rights throughout the Philippines. Over time, most of the bases were abandoned, and the U.S. military presence did eventually dwindle. However, in March of 1996, China fired a number of unarmed ballistic missiles across the Taiwan Strait, which splashed down just off the coast of Taiwan. The United States deployed two carrier battle groups to the waters around Taiwan to signal to Beijing to stand down and that an attack on Taipei would not be tolerated. It was this incident that led to the United States renewing its alliance with the Philippines and to begin strengthening its position in the region. In 1998, the Visiting Forces Agreement was signed and the number of American troops stationed in the Philippines increased. The United States and the Philippines began collaborating on fighting the War on Terror. Radical Islamist groups had begun operating in the southernmost sections of Mindanao. These terrorists claimed to have ties to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. However, in 2012, an incident led to Filipino and American forces refocusing their attention on China. A confrontation between Philippine and Chinese naval vessels arose along the Scarborough Shoal Reef in the South China Sea. Both nations claimed the reef belonged to them as large reserves of oil and gas were found to be located in the area. Nothing came of the conflict other than the Philippines bringing the dispute before an international court, which ruled in their favor. Beijing refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the trial, and tensions over the Scarborough Shoal Reef continued. In 2016, Rodrigo Duterte was elected president and suggested the Philippines rely less heavily on the U.S. and look towards China for the future. In hindsight, that wasn't a complete surprise. Duterte ruled over the Philippines using draconian methods and an iron fist to punish anyone found with drugs of any kind. Thousands of Filipinos were arrested and killed as a result of his policies. Duterte took more of an authoritarian stance than a democratic one, which might have been why he sought closer ties to Beijing. However, in March 2022, when an invasion of Ukraine by Russia seemed all but inevitable, Duterte came running back to the United States for protection. The concern was that if Russia was willing to invade its neighbor, then China might be thinking about expanding its own borders by attacking Taiwan. The concern was that after Taiwan, the Philippines could be Beijing's next target. Talks began and it appeared the Philippines would allow the U.S. to resume operations at their previous base at Subic Bay and the nearby Clark Air Base. When Bongbong Marcos took over, the alliance was expanded to include nine bases in total. It was at this point that China began to recognize the major role the Philippines would play in hindering its future plans for the region. It is worth noting that not all the Filipinos are on board with the deployment of American troops within their borders. The older generations remember stories of colonization and what it was like to try to build a country after centuries of foreign powers ravishing their lands and oppressing the Filipino people. It was in 1992 that the last American-controlled military base in the Philippines was shut down. American troops still operated in the country on joint training missions, but there were no longer United States bases on Philippine soil. The reason for this was that many felt like having U.S.-controlled bases in the Philippines brought into question the true sovereignty of the nation. These same feelings are once again rising. The International League of People's Struggle is an anti-imperialist movement that seeks to warn people about the dangers of allowing foreign powers to have a military presence in sovereign nations and educate the world about the atrocities that happened due to colonization. They also voice concerns that in the past and present, U.S. troops perpetrated crimes against Filipino women and the LGBTQ community. This has included soldiers being tried and convicted of murder, sexual assault, and violation of human rights. However, in those cases, the American troops were almost always sent back to the U.S., where they were never held accountable for their crimes. Regardless of how the Filipino people feel, the government believes that having a U.S. military presence in the Philippines is vital to maintaining the status quo in the region.
China knows that the Philippines poses a threat to its power and influence now that the U.S.-Filipino alliance has been repaired and new U.S. bases have been set up in the region. Marcos Jr.'s administration has stated the Philippines would stand by and assist the United States in any armed conflict that arose with Taiwan and China. The reality is that the Philippines was likely always going to be in danger if China invaded Taiwan due to its proximity to the conflict. The Philippines decided to take a proactive approach to this threat and allied itself with the United States for additional protection, money, and resources in the years to come. This has left Beijing furious, and it's clear they now see the Philippines as a major thorn in their side. For the second time in its history, the US is poised to lose another war against China. But this time, the entire current world order is at stake. During the Korean War, the influx of hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops surprised American and NATO military planners who were caught completely off guard. While the US technically did not lose against China, in fact it scored truly apocalyptic losses on Chinese infantry, the US also didn't win the war, resulting in the current status quo on the peninsula. South Korea remains a strong US ally and economically powerful liberal democracy while Kim Jong-un rules the north and hurls missiles into the ocean to keep Godzilla at bay. Sure, some of you will claim there's no such thing as Godzilla and Kim's just a madman developing a nuclear weapons program, but riddle us this. Why hasn't there been a single confirmed Godzilla sighting since North Korea began launching missiles into the Pacific? This time, the US and China are set to go head-to-head -head in a war that will absolutely dwarf the clash between the US and Chinese troops in Korea. And this one's for all the marbles, boys and girls because the victor is guaranteed to shape the 21st century. If the US wins, the global status quo will remain the same. If China wins, an autocratic world order will almost certainly replace the current liberal one. And if it doesn't, it'll hurl the world into a fresh ideological conflict that'll make the Cold War look like the Anglo-Zanzibar War. This might sound like a lot of hyperbole, but the truth is the US and China represent two completely different visions for the global future. The United States is the dominant global power, and it certainly has its flaws but it's a train that can be steered and course corrected, with the historical global trend being toward a more liberal world order. China's very survival depends on upending liberal democracies who represent an existential threat to the iron grip of the Chinese Communist Party. Already, the difficulties of assimilating Hong Kong and Macau into the mainland communist government hint at a China where people are increasingly growing tired of the CCP's yoke. Eliminating all other alternatives altogether is one way to placate the masses. The linchpin of Chinese ambitions to break the US-led world order rests with Taiwan, and unfortunately for the US, that means China has all the advantages. This little island nation played a relatively minor role throughout the 20th century, but it's set to define the 21st century and beyond. The island nation is just offshore mainland China and enjoys a robust, healthy democracy that thrives even under the long, dark shadow of the Chinese Communist Party. China believes that the breakaway republic still belongs in the fold of the CCP and has repeatedly stated it will use force to reunify. Continued independence is simply not an option. So the die is cast, and an invasion seems inevitable. But why does the fate of this little island matter to the world? For one, Taiwan enjoys the protection of what's come to be called the Silicon Shield. Back in the 80s, as the US moved the manufacturing of microchips overseas where they could be produced more cheaply, Taiwan saw an opportunity. The nation invested heavily into building infrastructure to produce semiconductors and soon became a world leader in manufacturing them. With the United States Navy being the most powerful force on Earth, there was little concern over a hostile China next door to the world's largest supply of computer chips. But that calculus has changed, and where once the US could sail its carrier strike groups right past Chinese shores with no concerns, now it has to face a rapidly modernizing and expanding Chinese military. This puts Taiwan in serious jeopardy, and with it, the world's largest supplier of the most advanced computer chips on the planet. With the CCP in control of Taiwan's semiconductor production, it'll have the leverage to blackmail any nation it wishes, even America. Under threat of sanction, nations will have to carefully weigh how they respond to the CCP requests, or watch their economy crumble for a lack of computer chips. We've had a taste of this future with the shortage prompted by the COVID crisis, which for many was a wake-up call to the threat the world order currently faces. Secondly, Taiwan is part of the first island chain, a string of islands stretching from Japan through Taiwan and down to the Philippines and beyond. This chain of pro-US nations acts as a barrier and historically has contained the communist powers of the Soviet Union and China. This has left the US Navy as the guarantor of global trade security, and it's thanks to the US naval dominance that the world enjoys free, predictable, and stable trade for the first time in history. 
China breaking this first island chain shifts global power dramatically, as its warships will be able to freely come and go as they please and maneuver strategically important waterways, like the Malacca Straits, where if they so choose they can influence global trade as they wish. With Taiwan as the linchpin of any war between the US and China, this unfortunately leaves China with all the advantages, or at least most of them, because China is making one key error. Faced with the prospect of the United States effectively containing its forces via the first island chain, China has two options. The first is to attempt to break the chain militarily, as we seem to be on an inevitable course for. The second, however, is to break the chain diplomatically. Rather than expend military resources and capital in a confrontation with the US and its allies, China could leverage its massive economy and turn it into diplomatic pressure. For its part, China has attempted to do this. It alone holds the leash on North Korea, and it has pursued much closer economic ties with nations in Southeast Asia. This leaves South Korea's fate unknown in case the US and China go to war. Once it would have been a steadfast ally to the US, but its defense treaty with the United States does not compel it to go to war over Taiwan with its ally. With China already punishing South Korea economically over the deployment of US THAAD ballistic missile defenses on its soil in 2017, South Korea may not be looking to break its relationship with such a huge trading partner. And if South Korea reneges on its defensive partnership with the US over Taiwan, the American people may find themselves questioning why they've invested so much in defending the South for 70 years. But with other US partners, China has been far less successful. In fact, it's made some seriously egregious missteps. Once it looked set to spin Australia away from US influence with a robust charm offensive, which came to a crashing halt when the Australians discovered how deeply China had penetrated Australian political and educational institutions. China had been secretly working to influence the Australian youth and politics alike to be pro-CCP, and its continued aggression in the South China Sea was seen as an inevitable threat to Australian interests. When Australia called for an investigation into the origin of COVID, which looked into evidence of the virus being man-made and leaked in a lab by China, relations soured even further, leading to a trade war between the two nations. It's with the Philippines, though, that China's misstepped the most, and it could have just handed the US the keys to victory. Much like in Australia, China also waged a charm offensive against the Philippines and heavily courted the nation's last president, Rodrigo Duterte. Duterte was a populist autocrat who came to power on promises to crack down on violent crime and drugs. To his credit, he did just that by launching one of the largest campaigns of police brutality and abuse of the modern era. The International Criminal Court is currently considering an investigation into Duterte's campaign against crime and drugs based on reported hundreds of extrajudicial killings and even more beatings during his reign. Duterte also cracked down on political opposition as best he could, given that the Philippines was still a democracy, much to his chagrin. In short, Duterte was the kind of man China could do business with, a fellow autocrat with deeply anti-democratic sentiments. Relations between the US and the Philippines soured during this time, as US President Barack Obama called out Duterte for the extrajudicial killings that he was overseeing during his campaign against crime. The Philippines and China began to grow closer, and the future of the US-Filipino defensive alliance was in serious question. This would have been a disaster for the balance of power in the Pacific, effectively allowing China to break a large chunk of the first island chain without firing a shot. Even more importantly, it denied the US one thing it needs the most – bases close to China. This is America's biggest weakness in the Pacific. While China can base all air and naval power at once right on its own shores, the US is forced to fight an entire ocean away from its home. This severely limits the amount of firepower the US can bring to a fight, as well as complicating logistics and slowing down the pace and intensity of combat operations. Traditionally, the US has relied on regional allies to give it the geography from which to fight from, leveling the playing field against any Pacific threat. It's known as the tyranny of distance in the US defense circles, and America has invested heavily in neutralizing this significant deficiency. Now the stage was set for China to completely upset US Pacific strategy and perhaps open the door to victory in Taiwan and beyond. But China overstepped and misstepped, both. First, it failed to significantly influence Filipino elections after Duterte's final term, and the nation voted in favor of Ferdinand Bongbong Romaldez Marcos Jr., or simply Bongbong Marcos. Marcos is the son of renowned Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr., who ruled the country with an iron fist from 1965 to 1986. He was known for being grossly corrupt and eliminating any political opposition. But don't worry, the apple definitely fell far from the tree on this one, or so the entire world hopes. 
though in truth it's not exactly out of America's character to openly support dictators when it's strategically convenient. When it isn't anymore, well then it's time to get democratized, baby. Marcos's victory was a disaster for China. The Philippines' new president was a staunch US ally, and it sees China as an existential threat not just to the Philippines, but the greater South Pacific region. For his part, Marcos would probably be a lot less outraged at China if the nation hadn't been illegally building military bases in other people's territorial waters. The US has been criticized for neocolonialism, yet China is just doing things the old-fashioned way and taking territory by force. Under international law, every nation has an exclusive claim to waters a set distance from its shores. This can lead to conflict in places like the South China Sea, with so many different nations so close together. Citing post-World War II maps and claims that its sailing vessels have historically moved through those waters, China's laid claim to literally the entire South China Sea. And a quick look on the map reveals that China is in no way anywhere near its claims. China claims basically all of Vietnamese waters, half of the Philippines, and large chunks of Malaysia, Brunei, and beyond. China's claims include waters as much as 1,000 miles away from its own shores. This would be like the United States claiming basically all of Russia's Arctic coastline from Alaska, or all of the Philippines' west coast and most of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea's north coast from Guam. The Nine Dash Line has its origin in 1946, when Mao Zedong had drawn a map that suddenly showed the entire South China Sea as belonging to China, because, well, why not? Unsurprisingly, affected nations laughed China's claims away, given that these waters were critical for their own economies. They kept on laughing until the 90s, when China's growing naval might suddenly became significantly less funny. China regularly sent Coast Guard vessels with actual military vessels in the distance to harass the fishing fleets of other nations. It also began to build up artificial islands from which to project power, and today has established multiple bases commonly referred to as unsinkable aircraft carriers in the region. Now, nobody's laughing anymore, and China's bullying has extended to capsizing other nation ships and, in the case of Vietnam, simply moving their oil drilling wells right into Vietnamese territorial waters. In 2020, China sunk a Vietnamese fishing boat with eight men on board for fishing near the Paracel Islands, and in 2014 it carried out a similar attack captured on video. China has also used its much larger vessels to intimidate and harass oil exploration vessels from other countries. China started to shut other nations off of the energy and fish wealth of the South China Sea. The region is also estimated to contain one of the largest untapped oil and gas reserves in the world. So maintaining control of the waters China is contesting is becoming more and more vital. Filipino fishermen who made their living fishing off of reefs, now regularly patrolled by hostile Chinese vessels, began to feel the economic pain. To reinforce its own territorial claims, the Philippines began to station marines on various reefs or even floating wrecks, with China regularly ramming supply vessels or using water cannons to keep them away from resupplying their troops. The attacks slowed significantly during the Duterte years but have now resumed with the election of Bongbong Marcos, and Marcos has had enough. Marcos made multiple military bases available for U.S. forces shortly after coming to power. This was a major win for the U.S as it expanded its ability to station air power in the region, a chief concern for combating China in the Pacific. This only intensified China's efforts to bully Filipino vessels in the South China Sea, with the most recent incident including China erecting a floating barrier to keep Filipino fishermen out of a disputed reef. The barrier was dismantled by Filipino divers, and in response, Marcos announced even closer cooperation with the United States. The Philippines is a strategic linchpin for the U.S. in the Pacific. America's biggest weakness is the distance its forces have to travel to engage in battle. Even in a war that would take place primarily in the air and at sea, the tyranny of distance limits how long and how much the U.S. can fight. It even limits payloads on combat aircraft. However, the Philippines are less than 200 miles away from Taiwan at their nearest points, which would allow the U.S. air power to stage at Filipino airfields and run combat sorties against the Chinese ships and ground forces around or on the island. From the Philippines, U.S. air power could even regularly strike at the Chinese mainland, a critical need if the U.S. is to ensure victory over China in case of a war. Through its own bad behavior, China's ensured that the U.S. and the Philippines are closer than ever, and this has significantly weakened its own military position by doing so. As the old saying goes, China, you done played yourself. The People's Republic of China is huge. Not only is it the world's most populous country, with a population of around 1.404 billion people, it's massive land-wise, 
The country is approximately 3,700,000 square miles, making it slightly larger than the United States in land area. Although China spans five geographical time zones, the whole country follows a single standard time. China's home to 56 ethnic groups. Linguists estimate that there are nearly 300 living languages spoken in China, with Mandarin Chinese having the most speakers, around 955 million people. China is governed by the Communist Party of China, which administers the country from the capital of Beijing. The country is rapidly developing and is on track to become a superpower. Here are six places China is attempting to subjugate to expand its borders, economic, and global influence. Number 1. Tibet China has a long and volatile relationship with Tibet, beginning in the 13th century and throughout different periods in history. Tibet has been ruled by Chinese and Mongolian dynasties, and has also been an independent nation. In the first quarter of the 20th century, Tibet was ruled by Great Britain before once again becoming an independent nation. In 1950, Chinese troops invaded Tibet to enforce China's age-old claim to the country. Some areas became the Tibetan Autonomous Region and others were assimilated into neighboring Chinese provinces. In 1959, after a failed anti-Chinese revolt, the spiritual leader of Tibet, the 14th Dalai Lama, fled the country and set up a government in exile in India. During China's Cultural Revolution, many Buddhist monasteries were destroyed and thousands of Tibetans were likely slaughtered during martial law. Due to international pressure, in the 1980s China somewhat relaxed its grip on Tibet and implemented reforms. Currently Beijing continues to modernize Tibet, sometimes at the cost of the region's cultural heritage. Development has brought Han Chinese migrants and Western tourism to the area. Since the early 2000s, there have been protests in Tibet, especially on the anniversaries of politically significant dates. Human rights groups say that China continues to politically and religiously repress Tibet. Various activists worldwide campaign for an independent Tibet. There are several strategic and economic motives China has for governing the region. Tibet is highly important to China's sense of self and Chinese nationalism. Many Chinese leaders, past and present, have believed that no matter the lines drawn on the map, Tibet is fundamentally a part of China. They felt a strong nationalistic drive to return China to its ancient, far-flung Qing Dynasty borders. Tibet also serves as a buffer zone between China on one side and India, Nepal, and Bangladesh on the other. The Himalayan mountain range provides natural security as well as a military advantage. China is currently struggling to find a balance between environmental issues and yet not hinder the country's economic industry. China is hungry for natural resources and Tibet serves as a crucial water source as well as possessing significant mineral wealth. Since the early 2000s, Beijing has invested billions in Tibet as part of its wide-ranging economic development plan for Western China. Number 2. Arunachal Pradesh China also claims that the region of Arunachal Pradesh, the northeasternmost state of the 28 states of India, is a part of South Tibet and therefore a part of China. Aside from India, Taiwan also claims the South Tibet region. Arunachal Pradesh borders the Indian states of Assam and Nagaland to the south, and countries Bhutan to the west, Myanmar to the east. To the north, the demarcation line known as the McMahon Line separates Arunachal Pradesh from the Tibetan area of China. Historically, Arunachal Pradesh belonged to neither China nor India, but was dominated by several autonomous tribes. In 1913 to 1914, representatives from Great Britain, China, and Tibet held the Simla Conference to decide on the borderlines for Tibet. The Tibetan and British officials agreed on the McMahon Line as the border between British India and Outer Tibet. The Chinese representatives refused the demarcation line and have considered it invalid ever since. When China invaded Tibet in 1950 and the Dalai Lama later fled Tibet, India supported the Tibetan government, angering China. During the Sino-Indian border conflict in 1962, China captured most of the area of Arunachal Pradesh but ended up withdrawing. In recent years, tensions have risen as China has publicly claimed the region of Arunachal Pradesh. China is especially interested in a small district called Tawang, which borders Tibet and Bhutan. China has even gone so far as to destroy thousands of maps and make new ones, having renamed parts of Arunachal Pradesh with Chinese names. India, while not growing as fast as China, is still emerging as a regional economic powerhouse. China wants to dominate Asia and sometimes seems to look for ways to clash with India. Most importantly, it's strongly assumed that there are heavy deposits of minerals such as gold and lithium in Arunachal Pradesh. A large-scale Chinese mining operation found gold and silver deposits worth around $60 billion in the Lunzi County of Tibet, which is directly adjacent to Arunachal Pradesh. Number 3. Aksai Chin 
China and India also clash over another border region, Aksai Chin, near Kashmir. Aksai Chin is mainly in Hotan County, in the southwestern part of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, with a small area on the southeast and south sides lying within the extreme west of the Tibet Autonomous Region. India claims Aksai Chin as part of the Ladakh region of the Jammu and Kashmir state. Aksai Chin is a remote, inhospitable region where mainly nomadic tribes roam. The area was ignored until the 1950s when China built a military road through it to connect Tibet with Xinjiang. India was angry upon discovery of the road and it ended up being a major factor in the Sino-Indian border conflict of 1962. At the end of the clash, China retained control of around 14,700 square miles of territory in Aksai Chin. In 1993 and 1996, the two countries signed agreements to respect the line of actual control, the demarcation line that separates Indian-controlled territory from Chinese-controlled territory in Jammu and Kashmir. Not only does China want Aksai Chin for maintaining a direct route between Tibet and Xinjiang, it appreciates the territory for its strategic position. Aksai Chin is mostly high ground with an average elevation of around 17,000 feet. If China ever goes to war with its neighbors Pakistan, Kashmir, and India, the Aksai Chin region will enable it to take a commanding high position. Number 4. The South China Sea As well as claiming disputed land, China has also claimed islands in the South China Sea. In fact, China has taken to dredging the sea and building out uninhabited islands such as Woody Island or the Spratly Islands to tighten its control over the region. Six countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Brunei, Taiwan, and Malaysia hold different territorial, sometimes overlapping claims of the South China Sea, based on various historical accounts and geography. Adding to the tension, the US Navy frequently patrols the sea due to its alliance with several countries. China considers this to be a provocation. The South China Sea is very important to Beijing because it's a crucial commercial passage, connecting Asia with Europe and Africa. One third of global shipping, or 3.37 trillion US dollars of international trade, passes through the South China Sea. Furthermore, the seabed is rich with major oil and gas reserves. The US Energy Information Administration estimates the region contains at least 11 billion barrels of crude oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Also, the South China Sea is a vital food source, accounting for 10% of the world's fisheries. In July 2016, an international tribunal in The Hague ruled that China had no historic rights over the sea and that some of the rocky outcrops claimed by several countries could not legally be used as the basis for territorial claims. Beijing rejected the ruling. More recently, some Southeast Asian nations have considered having bilateral talks with China to settle the dispute. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations Aishan, has been working with China to create an official code of conduct to avoid clashes in the disputed waters. Number 5. Taiwan China has had an ongoing dispute with Taiwan for decades. It views Taiwan as a breakaway province that will eventually be part of the country again. But many Taiwanese citizens want a completely separate nation. Historically, Taiwan was a part of China. Taiwan was governed by China's Qing Dynasty from 1683 to 1895, when Japan won the First Sino-Japanese War. China had to cede the region to them. After World War II, Japan was forced to relinquish to China control of the territory it had previously taken. Civil war broke out in China in 1946 and ended in a victory for Mao Zedong's communist army. Chiang Kai-shek and his Chinese Nationalist Party, known as Kuomintang or KMT, fled to Taiwan. The KMT dominated Taiwan's politics for many years until after Chiang Kai-shek's death. Having inherited an effective dictatorship and under pressure from a burgeoning democracy movement, Chiang's son, Chiang Ching Kuo, began assessing a process of democratization, which in 2000 led to the election of the island's first non-KMT president, Chen Shui-bian. Meanwhile, China treated Taiwan with great hostility. In the 1980s, relations between China and Taiwan started improving. China put forth the One Country, Two Systems plan, under which Taiwan would be given significant autonomy if it accepted Chinese reunification. Taiwan refused, but did relax rules for its citizens to visit and investment in China. Since the 1970s, the US has been a close ally of Taiwan and has sold billions in defensive weapons to the country. Currently, US policy in the region has been described as strategic ambiguity, seeking to balance recognition of China's emergence as a regional power with the US support for Taiwan's economic success and democratization. 
In recent years, China has been alarmed by Taiwanese citizens electing politicians who favor independence from China. Furthermore, the Taiwanese public has staged various protests about Beijing's policies regarding the country. Currently, Taiwan's legal status is unclear, in limbo. The country has its own constitution, democratically elected leaders, and its own armed forces with about 300,000 active troops. China wants Taiwan to return to the fold because of nationalism. Also, Taiwan being a part of China is a strategic defensive move. If Taiwan was to become an independent nation with its close ties to America, the US would likely have a naval port and military base in Taiwan, right on China's doorstep. Number 6. Hong Kong one final place where China is attempting to expand its power is Hong Kong. At the end of the First Opium War in 1842, part of Hong Kong Island became a British colony. Later, China leased the rest of Hong Kong, the new territories, to the British for 99 years. By the 1950s, Hong Kong had become a busy commercial port and a manufacturing hub. As the end of the 99-year lease approached, Britain and China held talks on the future of Hong Kong. In 1984, a deal was reached that Hong Kong would return to China in 1997 under the principle of one country, two systems. As a result, Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy with its own legal system and borders, and rights including freedom of assembly and free speech for the next 50 years. However, in recent years Beijing has been treading on Hong Kong's rights. Artists and writers say they're under increased pressure to self-censor, and democracy has been limited. The current leader was elected by a 1,200-member pro-Beijing election committee chosen by just 6% of eligible voters. Throughout the spring and summer of 2019, large protests erupted in Hong Kong in response to a proposed bill permitting the extradition of fugitives to mainland China. Citizens worry the bill will be used to target, detain, and extradite political dissidents. Beijing's response to the protests has become increasingly violent as the citizens show no signs of backing down. The United States has a problem. The Chinese Navy has officially become the world's largest navy. Thankfully, the capabilities of the Chinese Navy are decades behind that of the American Navy, but in any confrontation with China, the US Navy will at best only be able to call upon 60% of its fleet, thanks to naval commitments elsewhere in the world. When forced to face off against just over half of the US fleet, the Chinese Navy's chances for victory in any Pacific conflict quickly escalate. For now, though, the US Navy doesn't need to worry. China is still not a true blue water navy that's capable of operating for extended periods of time far away from its own shores, although it has sent task forces to the Horn of Africa to aid in anti piracy efforts. Overall, on a ship to ship basis, the Chinese Navy's technology ranges from a decade to four decades behind the United States, especially amongst its very noisy submarine forces. Yet the situation is quickly changing. China has in recent years funded a major investment in its naval forces, which has has resulted in a frenzy of shipbuilding. Currently, China outbuilds the United States when it comes to ships. Though again, it's important to remember that the capabilities of each ship so far fails to match up to those of American ships. Also, this is still the initial surge phase of China's new modern navy. After reaching a predetermined target number of ships, the shipbuilding frenzy will slow to a rate similar to the US's. China's growing naval might is worrying not just the United States, but many of China's own neighbors who have routinely been bullied by China's growing might. Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam, to name a few, all have serious disputes with China, which has on numerous times claimed territory rightfully within their territorial waters for itself. China's frenzy of island building in the South China Sea has also sparked international concerns, and while President Obama's shifting of naval power to the Pacific quickly halted the island expansions, China has so far refused to vacate the five islands it has built. This is in spite of a ruling by The Hague which dismissed China's fanciful claims to the region. Instead, China has fortified its South China Sea holdings, adding radars, flight lines for combat planes, and missile defense systems. The message is clear, China is not budging. While the US is not seeking a military confrontation with China, its commitments to defend many of the nations that China is currently bullying or intimidating may force its hand. In that case, the US may find itself with its hands full dealing with Chinese naval and ballistic missile power, unless radical reforms of the American Navy take place. The greatest threat to American naval forces in the Pacific is China's staggeringly large stockpile of anti-ship ballistic missiles. These giant missiles can be fired from the heart of China and guided to their target as far out in the Pacific as Guam by a system of space and airborne radar and targeting assets. With thousands of these missiles, the US fleet appears to be in serious jeopardy. To counter the ballistic missile threat from China, the US Navy has adopted a doctrine of dispersed operations, while in the past battle groups would be centered around an aircraft carrier to fight relatively close together. The new doctrine has led the Navy to widely disperse its battle groups so as to make each individual ship harder to hit. 
New investments in anti-ballistic missile systems have also added robust capabilities to American fleets, and a new generation of anti-missile missiles have performed very well in testing. Yet a major problem for the U.S. Navy is the sheer number of ballistic and conventional missiles China could throw at American ships. While it's highly unlikely that China would be able to achieve air superiority against the U.S. Navy, new extremely long-range anti-ship missiles would see China fighters able to use their weapons against American ships from hundreds of miles away and never even get close to American interceptors meant to protect their ships from this threat. Then there's the threat posed by Chinese submarines, which could fire off anti-ship missiles while lurking under the waves. They would need to be closer to their American targets than Chinese jets, but would still be able to operate far outside of the traditional security envelope established around American battle groups. One solution to these twin problems is to simply push out the radius of the security envelope around a battle group. Unmanned refueling tankers are already being deployed amongst American fleets, and this will allow a carrier's combat air patrol to operate much further away than normal, which will let them enter intercept Chinese aircraft before getting close enough to fire. To counter the submarine threat, the U.S. Navy under its Ghost Fleet Overlord program has been testing autonomous ships that can assist manned ships in combat. One of these ships is an anti-submarine warfare platform, which would patrol the waters around a battle group completely on its own, searching for Chinese subs and engaging any discovered. Another key to defending American ships in the Pacific is a heavy investment into technologies and tools to disrupt China's kill chains or a chain of assets required to successfully launch a ballistic missile and accurately guide it to its target a thousand miles away. This includes space-based and airborne surveillance and radar platforms, as well as communication nodes, and while details remain classified, the US so far remains confident that it can disrupt China's kill chain capabilities enough to protect most of its ships. For their part, the Chinese have never demonstrated they have the sophistication to implement and protect a kill chain system that can successfully target and destroy a ship far out at sea. New plans are calling for a heavy investment by the U.S. in anti-ballistic missile systems, such as directed energy weapons and kinetic interceptors such as railguns. Currently, one of the biggest problems with protecting American fleets is not an inability to accurately target and destroy incoming missiles, but simply that China would rely on overwhelming barrages meant to force U.S. ships to expend all the missiles in their batteries trying to protect themselves. Once each ship's battery is depleted, it is for all intents and purposes defenseless against incoming missiles, especially of the ballistic variety. A directed energy weapon would have no magazine size limits, as it would fire off electrical power generated by the ship. It could fire for as long as the ships generate electricity and intercept incoming missiles at the speed of light, making it incredibly accurate. High energy lasers could burn out missile warheads and guidance electronics, causing them to prematurely detonate or simply fly out of control. Kinetic railgun interceptors would still need a magazine of projectiles, but these projectiles are both much cheaper to produce than a modern missile and can be made much, much smaller. A single railgun battery could hold hundreds of rounds for a fraction of the cost of a traditional vertical launch cell on a big warship. But even those innovations aren't enough to successfully defeat China at sea, because the fact remains that China has invested extremely heavily in both anti-ship ballistic and traditional missiles. To make matters worse, the U.S. Navy's current ship designs are only making China's job of destroying them easier. For decades, U.S. ships were built around extremely powerful suites of radar and other sensors, which gave them incredible situational awareness and command of their battle space, but in a modern war also make them incredibly easy targets to find for any sophisticated foe, such as China. In essence, U.S. ships and their sensor systems put out so much electronic noise that finding them out at sea would be easy for China, as it would be for you to find a screaming person in a pitch black room. High energy sensor systems are an absolute necessity for any naval force, so simply doing away with them is not realistic. Instead, the Navy needs to seriously rethink its current force structure. At the moment, the US Navy is very destroyer and cruiser heavy. It's the biggest, meanest guy on the block and packs the strongest right hook in the world. To defeat China and not suffer catastrophic losses in doing so, the American Navy needs to go on a serious diet and slim down. Rather than relying on traditional concentrations of big destroyers and guided missile cruisers, the US Navy needs to slash funding for those large ships and invest in a force of mid-range ships about half the size of a modern destroyer. These smaller ships would carry less ordnance, but would be cheaper to build, maintain and operate, and could be fielded in large numbers versus smaller numbers of bigger ships.
These medium-sized ships would be widely dispersed across a battle space, and thanks to their sheer numbers and smaller profiles, enough of them could get close enough to Chinese forces with an acceptable degree of risk that they could take advantage of passive sensors to track and target Chinese ships and shore targets. Passive sensor systems put out much less energy than active systems, and thus a larger network of smaller ships could relay targeting data back to the main battle group while remaining relatively undetected. America's big guns could safely remain undetected at sea and still be able to service targets accurately. New studies call for these smaller ships to be completely unmanned or at least optionally manned with crews no greater than 24. In fact, the US Navy is looking to adopt unmanned ships in a big way, literally and the service is right now testing two large unmanned ships. Under program Ghost Fleet Overlord, the US Navy intends to build several large unmanned vessels or LOVES to support its traditional manned forces. The goal of these LOVES will be to offset the risk of battle groups being overwhelmed by saturation strikes and expending all of their missile batteries in self-defense. In essence, each LOVE will be nothing more than a seaborne missile battery, housing hundreds of missiles, which could either be fired remotely at targets or used to resupply battle groups at sea. Nicknamed Arsenal Ships, the concept dates back to the 1980s, and each individual ship could carry about half the firepower of an entire battle group. That's a hell of a lot of punch in just one ship, but many experts fear that that's exactly the problem. These big robotic missile ships will still rely on extremely powerful active sensor systems that will be easy for Chinese forces to spot and target. Arsenal ships also have one other major downside. They serve no purpose outside of an actual war. Unlike traditional manned ships, arsenal ships could not be deployed on training missions, relationship building missions with a friendly country, or counterterrorism missions. They would have only a single use, in only a single scenario, giving the Navy a lot less bang for its buck dollar for dollar. Instead, experts are calling for the Navy to switch from large robotic arsenal ships to the fleet of smaller unmanned or optionally manned ships we discussed earlier. Not only will this give the Navy a much greater survivability against Chinese missile forces, but the ships could still carry out a range of peacetime missions as well. In fact, a recent study showed that for the same price, the US Navy could actually get 1.4 times the missile tubes going with a fleet of smaller ships than the current plan to purchase lower numbers of big robot arsenal ships. In the end, hopefully the Navy never needs to implement any of its plans to defeat China at sea, as nobody wants to see a confrontation between the two nations. Yet, for the US and many of the South Pacific nations that have found themselves bullied by China in the last decade and a half, it's a comforting thought to know the US Navy is always preparing for that unfortunate happenstance. Now that you've gotten through this video, why not learn more about the world we live in by clicking this video over here? Or if that doesn't do it for you, why not try out this other one instead? Go ahead, click that button and learn something new and exciting right now!